Hello everyone, uh, my name is Lloyd de Jong. I'm South African, I'm based in Warsaw, Poland. What we're doing is a, is a series discussing Islam. I'm talking about Islam not from the perspective of the Quran and the Hadith, which everyone does. My expertise is on Islamic law, which is known as the Sharia and the Fiqh. So the Sharia is the, the moral rules, the laws derived from all of the Islamic sources, and the Fiqh is the application of those by the scholars. So we're doing an analysis of Islam, and at the moment I'm looking at the relationship between the, the, the Gnostics and Islam, which claims to be a Gnostic religion. Islam explicitly claims to be a Gnostic religion. And so we're looking at some of the links and how it drew, well, basically plagiarized its sources and how it applies these ideas, how it's taken those sources but also just modified them. It, it's scrambled them, does its own, does its own interpretation of them. And of course, it so it denies Christianity, and also it takes the Gnostic ideas and it twists them just as it twisted the Christian Christian biblical ideas. So we're looking at a comparison between the three, and then we're going to go into the idea of the occult within Islam. We're going to start looking at some of now. A lot of this has not been done, so I'm probably the first person that I know to really dive into into this depth, especially within Islamic law. And we're going to see just how Islam is a very much a cult religion and last time we, when i did the show we were dis discussing the direct links islam has to freemasonry so we're going to look at some of that today if there any questions please let me know and i will jump in so let me just pick up from a couple of slides in where we where we stopped last time right now these are different worldviews so we're trying to contrast the worldviews right so in gnosticism humanity is alienated you have a distant god the monad who is isolated, alone, and does not ever come to earth, right? This is the same whether you're looking at Gnosticism or Islam, whereas the Christian worldview is there's a good creation, right? Creation is good. On the sixth day, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. That's Genesis 1.31. Gnosticism does not have a positive view of creation. It's very negative because matter is cursed. Matter is evil. Matter was made by an evil God. Some of the Gnostic texts that identify the Jewish slash Christian God. Now, if you're a Jew, I mean, we, we can debate and argue about like the, the concept of Jews and Christians and Jesus, but that's not the, the point of this right now. So you've got, if you take um, Jehovah, right, to, uh, so the Gnostic texts identify Jehovah as what is called the Demiurge. The Demiurge was an evil God without going into the long creation myth that they have, who created the world and the Jehovah is on a lower level spiritually than humans. Humans are of a higher, of a greater level, and they need to return to to their vision of this mystical paradise. So, Islam and Gnosticism both deny a direct link between creation and God. Now, Islam denies that Jesus had direct knowledge of God. Okay, What they say is that Jibreel, the Ruh, the spirit of Allah, intercedes However, interestingly, when you look through the Islamic sources, you'll find that there is the Ruh Muhammadi, right? The spirit of Muhammad. So the spirit of Muhammad is the spirit of Allah because Muhammad is made from Allah. And in fact, the spirit of Allah was made long before the world was created. And this is what intercedes. So Muhammad actually just usurps the position of the Holy Spirit and usurps the position of Jesus. Now, God has no contact with and remains outside of the created order. Islam holds the same view. So Allah only descends down to the lowest heaven and Gnostic salvation is not from sin. It's liberation from ignorance by having correct knowledge. Correct knowledge is very much like wokeism. We covered that in the early parts of this discussion. Your people noticed there were strong links between what is known as wokeism and Gnosticism. Now, Islam saves us from the Jahiliyyah, which is the time of ignorance, the time of paganism, the time of barbarism prior to Islam. See, Islam brings the sacred knowledge. Jahiliyyah is the opposite of Islam. We are the ignorance. So just as Gnosticism saves us from ignorance, Islam also saves us from ignorance. So those are connections. Now, you've got salvific knowledge within Gnosis, right? Versus knowledge of a mighty salvific God. These are the two worldviews, Christianity versus Gnosis and Gnosticism. Right. Um, I'm going to now Gnostic salvation is not based on knowledge and faith in God, but on works. Right. So there's a very big difference here as well. So instead of having faith 
and this will give you salvation without going into the theology because that's not the, the point of this it's it's about works however it's the imaginative treatment of a private vision so gnosticism is a subjective view and i will get to as we go through the series i will talk about how islam treats the very same thing but it's no different to this because when they go into their gnostic visions when they do their occult rituals and they go through these magical practices and the incantations they the whole intent is to lose the rational state to detach from rationality rationality is to a large degree forbidden within islam it's been banished from islam to a large degree they go into what they call a pre-rational and post-rational state so they want to go into these different stages that are all non-rational where you commune with god you go through you pierce through the 99 veils and you enter into the throne room and you commune directly okay so let's i'm just going to skip over this i did cover some of these things so i've done some of this okay now this knowledge divide right between those who know and you will see this explicitly within islam as i go through that as well you're going to see how just as in gnosticism islam splits the those who know the spiritual elite from those who do not know which is the ordinary people so christianity very much deals with the concept of ordinary people there is no sacred knowledge no secret knowledge now have a so to repeat this section the concept of the ulama now everyone says well islam has no pope well they have a council the ulama singular alim is the term donating the scholars right that's their spiritual elite now of almost all disciplines though more specifically to the scholars of the religious sciences in islam religion is a science in fact the major sciences are religious now it's very hard to determine that religion is a science but in islam it is a science right you have secondary science called the sciences the amal like the ilm al amal right which are the practical sciences but the major sciences then that secondary are the religious sciences so the ulama who are the council the highest level of scholars are the guardians the transmitters and interpreters of religious knowledge of islamic doctrine and the law and embracing those who fulfill religious functions in the community that require a certain level of expertise in religious and traditional issues fine and well so what this means is that there are two variations two sides within islam you have the sharia which is following the law and that's what lay muslims are to do just follow the law they get told these are the rules obey them and of course as the quran says we hear and obey that's what the good muslim says this is called taqlid you follow you become a follower and then you have the haqiqa right the concept of the ultimate reality the ultimate truth the secret knowledge and this is purely for the elite level of scholars who are the sufis so that's for the elite level and they practice the religious aspect because islam has different what's called obligations here fard al ain and fard al kifaya so fard al ain is a personal responsibility also known as also known as universal but personal in other words like the five daily prayers right that's something that every muslim has to do but then you have a thing called fard kifaya communal obligations some people that small minority it's only a crazy small minority that small minority has to do these things or well, the crime or the sin of non-commission falls upon all of the muslims and therefore the spiritual elite does the ritualistic spiritual aspects the occultic aspects they are the ones who carry out these procedures these these acts of worship as they would see it and thus the need to do it is taken away from the rest the rest simply have to follow the rules okay so now let's have a look the ulama now this is according to the encyclopedia of islam which is the gold standard for knowledge of islam written by some of the top scholars in the world muslim and non-muslim the ulama have long been seen as a distinct group a regulated and structured body expressing the popular voice constituting the solid framework of permanent government behind changing dynasties it admits that the ulama have been there for hundreds of years for centuries directing things these are the this is what you would call the deep state now i want to make a point in this and then i'll pause for a second think of something like the kgb how old is the kgb uh harry how old do you think is the kgb um i i think it's, uh, from the beginning of the revolution maybe even during the tsar they had a different name before okay so uh, so roughly but the kgb i mean we know them from russia from the 40s or whatever right 40s 50s something like that yeah. right 
So prior to that, I forgot the name before it was something with NDDB or uh, NKVD you yeah. had. Mm -hmm. Now, understand, now think of MI, MI5, think of MI5, right? British Secret Service. How old are they? Well, we could say, well, they date back to the war, they date back to, you know, the, the 40s, World War II. However, both of these services, governments have always needed clandestine services. They've always needed spies, informants. They've always needed a network, a secret network. These both, so for instance, you can trace the MI5 back to the 13th, 14th century, right, to Queen Elizabeth I. You can go back as far as that. And so you'll find that this, it's always been there. The function has always remained. The names may have changed, but the function remains. Things like MI5, MI6 go back hundreds of years. Same with the KGB. They're not new. They simply come into the open, and that's what you see openly, right? But, and Islam has its own secret body in the background administering things, managing Islam. And this is the ulama. This is like your council. Right. So, okay, I'll skip over this. I've done some of these. I've mentioned here somatic ones. So Gnostics divide humanity into categories, right? Some of the basic categories they use, the somatics, who are, exist on a bodily level. The psychics who function at the level of mind, intellect, emotions, and the pneumatics or the Gnostic Hoi who, who are worthy of understanding the mysteries. And of course, the Gnostics consider themselves these Gnostic Hoi, the elite. Right? Now, this is a very antithetical view to what we would call the typical Western moral view. Right? Um, I'm going to skip over this again, but understand that they invert our concept of morality. Right, just as you hold, from a Christian or Jewish point of view, you might hold the body is sacred because God made it. They don't. Only the thought is sacred. Only what is non-material is sacred. And thus, fantasy takes precedence over reality, over matter. Okay, um, I think we covered this last time as well. But Lo so, yeah. Lloyd, can I stop you for a second? Can, sure. can you say a little bit about the creation story in Islam? Actually, no, I because don't know. Because you said that yeah. uh, Allah is not part of this physical realm, that he never, uh, he was never here, right? N not physical appearance in any form. Allah is not physical. He is meant to be purely spirit, purely mat uh, purely just spiritual. In fact, Allah has no shape that we can discern. He's, we're not able to comprehend him in any way. He, d he does not conform to any kind of thought that we can create. That's the idea of Allah. So he's, he's nothing, whereas within the Western worldview, right, and this is obviously inherited from, from the Jewish worldview, we are created in God's image, right? We are the Imago Dei, as the Catholic Church would say it, but we are created in God's image. Whereas in Islam, there is no way to reconcile who, who and what man is with what Allah is. Allah is unknowable, completely mysterious. His shape, his presence, everything is completely unknowable. Um, yeah, the, I have not looked. The thing is also, I don't have any notes on the on the idea of the um, of the creation myth of Islam, but I will touch briefly on one aspect of it. So, within Islam, hmm, I'd have to I'd have to go into some other notes. I'd have to things I'd have to divert off of this. So I'd rather we come we make it put a put a pin in that. Yeah, we I'm come back to that the next time. But short version, Allah, the very first thing that Allah made is Muhammad. Right? So, the very first thing that Allah makes is Muhammad. So, he takes a piece of himself, according to various narr narr narrations. Allah takes a piece of himself and he, he shapes and forms Muhammad. And then he makes a statue of Muhammad and he puts that statue of Muhammad and he hangs it on a tree, the tree of life, in the, in the garden. Right? And there he instructs all of the spirits of the world. Actually, I can show you that. Actually, that's, that's actually much easier for me to just actually go and read you that. Just show it to you then that makes life a little easier since you asked about it. So, now let me find this. So, awesome. So, this is Muhammad, the seal of the prophets. In case you've ever wondered. Okay. So, let's, let's go here. So, let me 
drop down here. Okay, so a couple of interesting things. Since you, but since I'm doing this, and we'll just deviate off the slides for a little bit. This is Muhammad's wife. This is his six-year-old, who he married, and then had sex with when he was nine. He says, she says to him, and she says lots of fun things. I must admit, she says to him, "This is this is the Ikhya Ulum al Din by Al Ghazali is the most respected scholar after Islam, after Muhammad himself. The Ikhya Ulum al Din is regarded as the most." the most important spiritual work of Islam after the Quran itself. And she angrily said to the Messenger of Allah, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. His wife says that. Okay, Muhammad's wife says that. And of course, in the Hadith, right, <laughs> in the Sahih, Muhammad himself says the superiority of Aisha over other women is like the superiority of this particular food dotted to other meals. So hey, I don't want to. I don't want to say that she doesn't know what she's talking about. Okay, so so let's have a look about the creation myths of Muhammad. Uh, by the way, Allah in <laughs> in Hebrew means curse. Okay, in Strong's H four twenty three, Allah means curse, because Islam loved borrowing things from from the Jews. Okay, now okay, so. In terms of, let's go back to the, not, not the standard creation, but not the standard Islamic narrative, all right? For instance, within the oldest of the biographies of Muhammad, the Sirat Rasul Allah, right? And which is then copied by others like Ibn Kathir and others, only three, they claim that only three people in the whole history of Arabia have been called by the name Muhammad. So they claim that only three people in all of history their parents had heard from the Jews and Christians that a new prophet was to be born in the near future and that his name would be Muhammad. Have you heard such a such a myth ever told, Harry? No, I didn't. I never heard of that. Yeah, no, nobody I know has. Now, understand, here you've got some months after Muhammad returns, two angels seize the apostle of Allah, that's Muhammad. They open up his belly and extracted a black drop. So, Muhammad became the perfect man. Now, that is known as the Qutb. Right? The Qutb is a very Gnostic concept. So this is where you able, are able to perfect someone. Then they thoroughly cleaned his heart and healed the wound. There's numerous tellings of this story. So Muhammad's heart, chest is open from throat to belly button. And they take his heart, they clean it, they, they extract the evil and they put it back. And there are numerous tellings of this. But uh, So you can see here's another one. Right, Two angels came to me with a gold basin full of snow. They seized me, opened up my belly, extracted my heart. And, and they split it and they extracted a black drop from it and threw it away. So Muhammad was made perfect. Muhammad's chest is opened. This is an award-winning biography of Muhammad. This is the portion of the Satan in you. Then they put Muhammad's heart in a golden tray filled with Zamzam water, washed it and replaced it in his chest. So this is all very much, this goes into the whole Gnostic concept. So they speak here of, so now I need to find the, the creation myth of Muhammad. Um, so let me, okay, I'll start with this. So this is Shakrastari. Okay, this is a major scholar, a major jurist of Islam called Shakrastani. And he says here, within their creation myth, long before the creation of the world, Allah took a ray of light from the splendor of his own glory and united it to the body of Muhammad. So he made the body of Muhammad like a statue and he places it on a tree. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll get to that. Saying, Muhammad, thou art the elect, the chosen. I will make the members of thy family the guides to salvation. This is exactly what in the Old Testament, or the Torah, that God says to Abraham. So now they're usurping the position of Abraham. And Muhammad said, the first thing which Allah made was my light and my spirit. So now Muhammad becomes the Holy Spirit. He becomes the companion of Allah at the beginning. So Muhammad's creation, and this is the Nuri Muhammadi, the light of Muhammad. And Muhammad thus is what is called the Muhammadan reality. So this is the, Muhammad is the holiness. He's the, he's the force, the energy. He is the essence that flows to all of the prophets. So it is through him that all the prophets have light and have the ability to do the things that they do because they contain a fraction of Muhammad's light. Any comment from you before I go on? No, please go on. So now Muhammad, so we're speaking of the Muhammad of pre-existence. This is now from a different one, okay? This is from a different set of scholars. So Muhammad was created of divine light. He had stood as a column of light before Allah for a million years in primordial adoration. And then Allah created Adam 
from the light of Muhammad. According to another passage of the Tafsir, he created Adam from the clay of divine might, from the light of Muhammad. So Muhammad is the substrate, the clay from which the first man was made. So understand within Islam, when you look outside of the Quran, because the Quran is just nascent Islam, it's the beginning. It is not the final product. It is not the end product of Islam. So the end product is the Sharia and the Fiqh. And of course, you've got what's called as the Sira, the biographies, properly the Gospels of Muhammad. So Muhammad is the substrate of which the universe is made and the substrate of which knowledge is made. He is the, the, he is the perfect knowledge as well as he's the substrate of which man is made. That's why you are born a Muslim, because you are made of the substrate of Muhammad. Okay, so not only Adam is formed from Muhammad's light, but the whole universe participates in this emanation of light. Emanation is very interesting because that is a Gnostic concept that the monad emanates beings, right? The light of the prophets is from Muhammad's light and the light of the heavenly kingdom is from Muhammad's light. And the light of this world and of the world to come is from Muhammad's light. Muhammad is the light of the world. He is literally the sun, right? In fact, even Allah's throne called the Arsh or the Arsh is shining, radiating with Muhammad's light. Muhammad is the light of Allah. Muhammad is the divine essence of Allah. Um, okay, so you can see here, the they directly emanate from Muhammad's light, okay? So understand this this is this is Muhammad this is the truth about Muhammad the primordial light is what is called the light of the prophet he is the created being who received the major share of the light don't forget within within christian doctrine again you've got satan who is the light bringer right satan is the light bringer Muhammad is the being who brought the light to the world within islamic doctrine so this is how the prophet Say, I was a prophet when Adam was still between spirit and body. So before Adam was created, Muhammad was. Which again is plagiarism from the Christian doctrine where God said, where Jesus says, Before the world was, I am. So now Muhammad is once again usurping the position of God. Right? Now, I'll do this one and I'll pause for a moment. In the Kitabi Ahwal Qiyamat, there's another account. It's recorded by a tradition that Allah created a tree. Now, the Jews would call this the tree of life. Um, uh, what is that called now again, Harry? What do you call the tree of life in, in Judaism? Et Chaim. Sorry? Et Chaim. Et Chaim, yeah. I, I, I'll forget it immediately. Sorry, you, you need to have a lot of phlegm in Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, so you goggle the language, you don't speak it. <laughs> so, with 4,000 branches, and they called it the tree of life, which is actually what the, the Jews call it as well. Then he created the light of Muhammad. So the first thing that was created after Allah creates this tree of life is the light of Muhammad in a veil of white pearl in the shape of a peacock. And he placed it upon that tree where it praised Allah for 70,000 years. So Muhammad praises Allah for 70,000 years. And then, okay, so, okay, we'll skip this because now, and then after this, when the light of Muhammad had praised Allah for 70,000 years, Allah created the light of the prophets out of the light of Muhammad. So all of the biblical prophets were created from Muhammad's light. Now notice they say here, they claim that Allah then created the Kaaba, right? The, the oldest building in the world is apparently in Mecca, the Kaaba. Then the Temple of Jerusalem. He then created the people of believing men and women, the Muslims. So then the souls of the Muslims were created. So everyone is pre-created. There's no original sin. He then created the spirits of the Jews and the Christians. Okay, and then the Magi, and of this perspiration, okay, so, okay, well, let me start over. Of the perspiration of the eyebrows of Muhammad, okay, so of the perspiration of Muhammad's eyebrows, Allah created the Muslims. Of the perspiration of the ears of the statue of Muhammad, he created the spirits of the Jews and the Christians. And then Allah created the earth. And then, of course, okay, what happens is he creates the lights of the prophets out of the light of Muhammad. And they said, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. So all of the prophets, every single prophet of Islam is a Muslim. Sorry, every single prophet in the Bible is a Muslim because they've all said the Shahada. This is the creation myth within Islam. The, this is the part they don't tell you out loud because it's embarrassing to them. They don't want Westerners to know this. Then God created a lamp of transparent red carnelian and the figure of Muhammad 
So he creates a, a statue of Muhammad that looks just like him and he places it inside this lamp. Muhammad gives light. He is the light bringer. Then the spirits went around the light of Muhammad, praising and worshipping Muhammad for a hundred thousand years. So they praised Muhammad. So all of the spirits, including yours, by the way, you too, if you're watching, you praised Muhammad along with all the angels for a hundred thousand years, which is longer than Muhammad praised Allah, by the way. Just so you know, Muhammad gets 30,000 extra years. And not only that, Muhammad is worshipped. Understand, the ultimate unforgivable sin in Islam is to have a partner with Allah, to worship something besides Allah. And here we have Muhammad being worshipped as Allah. Then Allah commanded the spirits to look upon the form of Muhammad. <clears throat> now it gets fun. They commanded the spirits to look upon the form of Muhammad and they obeyed. And who saw his head? So who looked? So when you were a spirit in heaven, if you saw Muhammad's head, you became a caliph and a sultan amongst men, a rich, powerful leader. Those who saw Muhammad's forehead became a just commander. Who saw his eyes became one who knows the word of Allah by heart. Those who saw his eye shadow became a singer. Sorry, blah, blah, cut out a section. Those who saw Muhammad's shadow became a singer and a player. Those who saw nothing, who didn't look at all, became a Jew and a Christian. I'll pause there for a moment, Harry. Got anything to say? Uh, no, I guess. Uh, let, let's see if there are some questions. Yeah. Anyone wants to ask a question or make a comment? Please raise your hand if you do. Hmm? No, nothing yet. Please go oh. ahead. Okay, so understand. Uh, so, yeah, go on. No, I'm sorry. I thought someone was there. Uh... Please go ahead. So, according to the Islamic narrative, you are a Christian or a Jew or a non Muslim because you basically didn't look at Muhammad or you stared at his small toe when you should have been staring at his face. I, 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 I have kid to you not. Myself. <laughs> you know, as, as I read about a review of a movie once, I laughed until a little bit of we came out. I, I think that would be appropriate for this kind of thing. So now, understand with, with Muhammad's birth, they've got, they've got numerous stories if you go through his Gospels. Muhammad fell into my hands and at his birth a voice reached my ears. The face of the earth became so illuminated I could see some of the palaces of Damascus by that light. Which is fantastic. Damascus is only 1,300 kilometers away from Mecca. So yeah, whatever. Okay, I'll pause it. Does, does that kind of does that help to answer your question about the creation myth in Islam? Yes, a little bit, of course. Thank you. So so now you can see how logical. Uh, I mean, whatever you might think of any other religion, but you can see what what Islam has to say, the parts they don't tell you. So Gnosticism, according to Lee, um, well-known author who wrote on, on Gnosticism, especially within the church, within the Christian church, the Protestant churches, though, how Gnosticism has crept in. He says it's a system of religious plagiarism. And Islam, if we go through the, through the notes, you'll see it is explicitly plagiar it explicitly plagiarizes Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, you name it. And it plagiarizes the Gnostic heresies, the Gnostic myths. Wow. It digs into those and just goes to town. So the Gnostic appropriation of every useful symbol or idea is referred to as the syncretistic aspect of the Gnostic type. And this is exactly the same as Islam. So if an ideal belief is seen as spiritually useful, the Gnostic would use it for his own version of the Gnosis of Allah, right? Which is what Islam does. So within the Gnostic view, though, Christ is, there's many different views, right? But he's a vague spiritualized being, one among many. Now, in some, he's perfect. In others, he's just a symbol, right? He's the perfect man, but he's perfect, not because necessarily he... Because he has to be perfect, because he can't be made of matter. He had to be a phantom, a ghost. He could not have had a physical body. He had to be matter. Then he would be filthy. He would be dirty, right? He would be cursed. So now, St. Augustine was a member of a second century Gnostic sect known as the Manichaeans. And St. Augustine explains that for them, Jesus was not only v revealed light... Understand, so this is the same idea they apply to Muhammad, right? But he was present everywhere. And again, we, if we have a look at the Islamic, if you look at the Sharia, we'll find out that, yes, Muhammad is present everywhere because he is, his essence is the spirit of Allah. It permeates the world, right? And in fact, if I keep going through the notes I was reading for you, you'll find that the universe is made for Muhammad. The world was made for Muhammad. The garden and hell were made for Muhammad, okay? 
And he signified man's life and salvation hanging on every tree. Did we just see a tree motif and revealed light, Harry? Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in Genesis. No, but did we just read about Muhammad hanging on a tree radiating light? Yeah, earlier you mentioned that. Yeah, so understand. So now you've got Islam is borrowing the Gnostic concept and they're applying it to Muhammad instead. So you've got a wow. twisted view of Jesus within Gnosticism and then you've got Islam taking that same view and adding their own spin to it within Islam. So for instance, we've just seen this, right? We've just seen he created the light of Muhammad. Okay, so we've just seen this. And of course, right, in Revelations, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of Allah. So these are illusions. They're stealing from these. They're trying to create a relationship within, from Islam to the biblical views. However, they're going by way of Gnosticism, which obviously disqualifies them as being anything related to, to the Bible. Right. Now, Gnosticism is a cult of special knowledge. It comes from the word Gnosis, or knowledge. Right. Now, there's a belief in an unknowable, supreme, absolute one deity, the monad. Right? Islam calls this the Tawhid, right? the indivisible nature of Allah. He's absolute one. There is no differentiation in the monad. Now, if there's no differentiation, how can Allah have different aspects? That's a really interesting. If he's one quality only, how can he have different characteristics? Okay, sorry, the monad is beyond human thought, and human thoughts cannot reach it. It's beyond comprehension. So the divine monad is beyond the material and rational world. And we can show you later from the Sharia, from the how the mystics view it, how the scholars of Islam view this. They say that you cannot reach Allah through the rational mind. You have to be use the non-rational, subjective mind. You have to go into trance states. Only through these rituals can you achieve knowledge of Allah. So they said that Allah does not enter the dirty physical realm. Thus the Christian incarnation is unacceptable to them. Right? And so they constantly talk about how Jesus is unclean. He was inside a little woman's womb. He dwelled in there with his sexual organs joints. He came out suckling, growing up, crying, eating, drinking, urinating. Because urine, blood and feces create ritual impurity within Islam. And the fact that a God can have these things attached to him would make him impure. And therefore Jesus could not have been holy. Jesus could not have been God. Therefore, they created a concept called Isa, a character called Isa, who is not the Christian Jesus. Okay? He dwelled there for Jesus, dwelled there for nine months, wobbling between excrement, urine, and menstrual blood. Right? And of course, he ended up being slapped on the cheeks by the Jews. There's constant denigration of both Christians and Jews within the Islamic polemic. Right? Um, so, okay. Now, God creates Adam and Eve, okay, within the Bible, and they procreate. But in Islam, every child is a new creation, thus there's no original sin transmitted, because your soul was made a long time ago, right? Okay, so I'll pause there. Any questions or comments from anyone? Let's see. Questions, guys, or comments? Anyone? One moment, please. No, nobody's raising his hand. Okay, now, let's look at Gnosticism, right? So... The Nicene Creed. Now, this is something that lots of people love to take to task. Oh, the Christianity was created at, the Bible was created at, uh, blah, blah, Nicene Creed, blah, 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 Council of Nicaea, blah, blah, blah. Right? So let's have a look at this from just a simple practical point of view. The Nicene Creed specifically states that Jesus was born, right, made incarnate as a refutation of Gnostic heresies. Notice the wording is very carefully chosen. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. You have the divine taking physical form. So we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Right? He was born of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He suffered death and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. Right? Those words are very carefully chosen because this flies in the face of what was the very common concept of the Gnostic Jesus back then which Islam also pushes. So understand that's why this was written. So then the Council of Nicaea was to, do, was to effectively, one, refute Arius from his heresy of Arianism, and two, to establish the doctrinal view. This wasn't to push a view. This was, the, this was the view that had been long established from the church fathers, but was now being challenged by heretics, right, who were, unfortunately, 
leaning heavily into Gnosticism. So the monad emanations have an element of the divine essence and angels and other powers are in the spectrum and they are worshipped. Jesus is on the spectrum, but Jesus is not a supreme being. He has knowledge. In many cases, he's adopted by God. He says, okay, you did a great job. Uh, I'm going to make you into a divine being, right? But Jesus is not the supreme being or not even a supreme being. Now, understand that if you look at Colossians 2.8, a lot of this was written by St. Paul. If you read through the works of St. Paul, it's very much an attack on Gnosticism again. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, in all fullness, the deity lives in bodily form. The words are very carefully chosen to say that Jesus was real, was a real human being. So there was this argument. Now, let's look at first and second century Gnosticism. Matter is evil, was the cry of the Gnostics. Right? This idea was borrowed from certain Greek philosophers. It stood against Catholic teaching because it contradicts Genesis 1.31. And God saw everything they had made, and behold, it was good. From a Christian point of view, the world is good because God made a good world. The matter is clean, okay? But it denies also the incarnation, right? If matter is evil, then Jesus Christ could not be the true God and the true man, for Christ is in no way evil. Gnosticism is the creation of God in man's image, in man's own image, which is arrogance, right? This is, again, something scripturally that is warned against from the biblical side, right, from the New Testament. And within the Old Testament, thus many Gnostics denied the Incarnation, claiming that Christ only appeared to be a man, but this humanity was an illusion. And this is precisely the claim that Islam makes. Some Gnostics, recognizing that the Old Testament taught that God created matter, claimed that the God of the Jews was an evil deity distinct from the New Testament God of Jesus Christ. They also proposed belief in many divine beings known as eons, and the eons mediated between man and the ultimate unreachable God. The lowest of these eons, the one who had contact with men was supposed to be Jesus Christ, not a supreme being, the lowest of the eons. Okay, now I'm going to show you this. Notice here, okay, this is Reliance of the Traveler, the world's most popular Sharia law manual, Islamic sacred law manual. And this is the orthodox view of, of Islam, right? This is the orthodox view of the Muslims, right? From the scholars, this is what is called the Ijma. This is what all Muslims are required to believe. This world and what is in it are accursed. This is a completely different view from the biblical view, from the Christian view. Right? Islam says the world is cursed except for the mem remembrance of Allah, which is basically ritual recitation of the names of Allah and thinking about Allah and going through these bloody, bloody, blah, blah, blah you know, rituals. But and someone with sacred knowledge, sacred knowledge, the nosis, right? So sacred knowledge is greater than the world. This is very important to them. So let me go to the Reliance A1, 2 to 9. So let me go to that. So I'm going to go to page 2. and let's, let's have a look at what Islamic doctrine tells us. I'll pause you for a moment. Any comments from anyone? Questions, guys? Anyone, please raise your hand. No, they are, they are shocked by the light, so not yet. Okay, so let's have a look at how Islam views theology and how it views, how it's supposed to administer the world, how it's supposed to manage the world in terms of religious teaching and so on, okay? So the Muslims will be kind enough to tell you within the Islamic law, the mind is unable to know the rule of Allah about the acts of those morally responsible, except by the means of his messengers and inspired books. Now, so your brain is too small to understand Allah, okay? Your brain is too small to understand who God is and to understand anything about what Allah wants and, and the acts of those morally responsible. You become, when you become 12, when you, be, you become balikh, you become morally responsible. You're able to buy property, able to take on debt, you're able to get married, etc. I mean, well, technically, no, that's not true. That last one, scratch the last one. You're able to take on debt as an adult, okay? You become morally responsible. In, what you do earn is the right to get killed for apostasy and, and to be beheaded for a bunch of interesting crimes. Okay, so so that makes you morally responsible. So you are able to be found guilty in court with things and be beheaded. Right. So you are not able to do this. The problem is that here the other will tell you it cannot be said that an act, though, which the mind deems good, which your conscience tells you is good, is good in the eyes of Allah. So you can't trust your small brain, your little pea brain 
cannot tell good from bad, cannot tell right from wrong. So therefore, you can't claim that its performance is called for and its doer rewarded by Allah, nor that whatever the mind feels to be bad is bad in the eyes of Allah. Like shagging a three-month-old baby? I mean, how can you say that's bad? You know, because you can't trust your conscience. You cannot trust your conscience, okay? Your conscience is wrong. We're going to tell you what to think. And it states here that so that it's non-performance called for and it's doer punished. You cannot use natural law. So the concept of natural law is outlawed within Islam, right? You're not to use natural law. You're not to use your conscience to determine right and wrong. It says that the basic premise of the school of thought is that the good of the acts of those morally responsible is what the lawgiver, and interestingly, the lawgiver, synonymous with Allah or his messenger. Notice, Muhammad is synonymous with Allah. Muhammad speaks with the full force of Allah. He is Allah for all intents and purposes within Islamic sacred law, within the Sharia. Right? For those who... Yeah, go on. It's interesting that uh, they said the mind feels and not the mind think or the mind knows. Uh, why hmm. is the emphasis was fi on feeling? Because, like you said, it's a sub subjective uh, feeling. It's very subjective. Yeah, it's very much. Yeah. If I go deeper into this, the thing is, I'm trying to go down one strand and I don't want to be jumping all over the place all the time. But if you read through this, if I, if I go into that particular strand that we, we go down that route, you're going to see it's highly subjective. It, it has to be because rationality, you're going to see now, rationality is not allowed. It's, it's as limited. It's allowed to a very limited degree, but circumscribed by very tight boundaries. So it's the extreme opposite of the Logos. And it's, uh, it's a rejection of the Logos. The <clears throat> and it's the origins of the postmodernism nonsense that we are suffering from. Amen. Preach it, brother. Preach it. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, you should. I think this is a very important point. Uh, try to emphasize it a little more in so, your next uh, event. Okay, so I hope this is not dry, but I'm trying to really draw parallels with certain thinking. Okay, trying to give a real big insight into this. But okay, so now... The lawgiver. Now notice, this is shirk. This is the ultimate sin in Islam. To to make someone partnered with Allah. And they're doing it. They're calling Muhammad Allah. Right? Now notice, okay, the basic premise of this school of thought is that the good of those, of the acts of those morally responsible is what Allah or Muhammad tell you are good. Okay? So they have indicated what is good by permitting it or asking it to be done. Or they've done it by example, right? And the bad is what the lawgiver has indicated is bad by asking it not to be done. The good is not what reason considers good, nor the bad what reason considers bad. They're telling you to reject your reason. They state here in the Islamic law, in the sacred Islamic law, it states, good and bad, according to the school of thought, is the sacred law, not reason. Reason is... Insanity. Insanity. So reason they can is rejected. Simply, yeah, go yes. yeah, no, yeah, please, I'm, I'm interrupting you. No, go, go on, please, no, go on. But this is really a, a key point here because it means they can simply change their scriptures and, and decide uh, every time based on a whim or a need to change the, the very base of morality. Correct. It's and like, they've done so through the centuries until they achieved the, the Sharia, the Ijma. Yeah. That's exactly what they did. Uh, yeah okay go on uh, any any questions guys or comments this is a very important key here this Based is islamic you. morality summed up it's in the sharia if the sharia says it's right it's right if the sharia says it's wrong it's wrong your your reason is not to be trusted and you can be punished for applying reason i understand uh one second we do have a question let's let's try get real please go ahead yeah hi can you hear me yeah yeah, um, I'm really shocked, actually, with some of the information that you're sharing with us. Um, you mentioned that Muslims, um, they, 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 they can basically mention something like they can shag a three-year-old. That's three legal. Month. I can prove that to yeah. you. I can show you that within the law. It's very legal. Yeah. Really? So, so they can actually do that? Wow. Shall I, shall I, nuts. Shall I deviate? Uh, Harry, do you want me to show that? Shall I just go quickly there? Shall I go there for a moment? Please do. Please do, yes. Okay, so um, okay, so I'm gonna find a couple of so so let me show you that. Uh, so I need to look through the laws. I'm gonna show you a couple of things here. Uh, 
So notice that an infant in Islam is defined as an infant in the cradle, okay? A baby in the cradle, okay? So now let's have a look at the crime. A husband who accuses his wife of adultery is disciplined. So this is a man who goes to the court and accuses his wife of infidelity. She's shagged another man. And the court punishes him because he has accused her falsely. Because he has accused her when adultery is impossible, such as when the wife is a mere infant. Your thoughts on that? What's the source? Where did you read that from? This is the Reliance of the Traveler and the Tools of the Worshipper. It is the most popular, it is the most sold, the most read, the most owned, the most common Islamic law manual, the Sharia and Fiqh manual in the world. So, but where does it say that uh, Muslims can actually fornicate with a I'm going to get to that, but understand you're looking at a man who has a wife who is an infant and he's accusing her of adultery. So, yeah, Lloyd, that's he will be punished. fine, but the question is, you made a claim. That yes, Muslims, I did. Like, that they that they can, um, I'm not a Muslim myself, but that they can um, have sex with a three-month-year-old. That's completely shocking. Well, you've I've just seen evidence of it. Um, you've just you've just seen um, evidence of that's, that. That's not really evidence because that, you know, it doesn't claim that you, you can do that as a Muslim. It implies very clearly. If you're there's married no... to an infant, then what do you do with a married woman who is who happens to be an infant? Do you just drink beer and alcohol the whole night? And you're accusing no, her of adultery. What I'm saying is, where does it say that you can? So hold on a second then. We shall go through the law and I will show you. Okay. So the guardian must marry. So when a woman wants to marry, okay, when she asks to marry, the guardian must marry her to him whether she is prepubescent or not. Okay, let me continue from here. A guardian may marry his prepubescent daughter to someone for less than the amount may not, sorry, may not marry his prepubescent daughter to someone for less than the amount typically received as marriage payment by similar brides, nor marry his prepubescent son to a female who is given more than the amount. So you can marry prepubescent children. Let's continue. Here they discuss the divorce of a wife who is prepubescent. Okay, we've just discussed maybe she was having sex with another man, so you're divorcing her. Now, they speak of Quran 65.4, which is the waiting period issue, which everyone brings up. This is the exegesis of that within Islamic law. A waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse, right? So you're divorced after intercourse. Whether the husband and wife are prepubescent, have reached puberty, or one has reached puberty and the other has not. Intercourse means copulation. Is that clear enough to you? Wow, that's that's not. I'm, I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on. Yeah, go on. I'm going to show you a couple more. Let's have a look and see what else we can find. So the waiting period okay, again, prepubescent. And let me bring up another Sharia manual. I'm going to. I'm going to bring up a different one because I think we need to. Oh, sorry, go, ask me your question in the meantime, please. And just if you can, you know, um, put a source to that book that you, you were reading from in the group or somewhere, I don't know, just so that we can have a look at it. Yeah. Okay. So now let me go. Now, for instance, I'm going to go. Okay. I'm just bringing up another reference. This now. In Islam, okay, these Sharia manuals are still in use in court today, right? They're still in force within the law. For instance, I'm going to show you the second most commonly used manual in Pakistani courts, okay? So this one is still in use in Pakistan, as an example, okay? As you know, Pakistan is, is, is one of the craziest countries in the world, but uh, let me go here. Okay, so this is Neil Bailey's Digest of Mohammedan Law. It's the Digest of Mohammedan Law still consulted in the court system in Pakistan for religious legal advice. When they say religious, they mean legal because the law is a religious act and the law is religious and religion is the law. Let's have a look here. 
The fourth rule, when a man has had sexual intercourse with a girl under the age of nine years and has ruptured her vagina, they call it politely the parts, it is unlawful for him to have further connection with her but she is not released from her ties if connected with him by marriage or slavery. If no rupture, what they refer to, and I can go to some other manuals and it gets really graphic, what they mean is a 50-year-old man has stuck his dick in a three-year-old, has stuck his dick in a six-month-old baby, okay? And I can, we can go there and it gets pretty ugly, and he has torn the vagina from the vagina to the anus, okay? He's ripped that skin. If no rupture has taken place, the prohibition is not incurred according to the most valid opinion. If you stick your dick in a child and you don't destroy her vagina, go ahead, keep doing it. It's just fine. Let me go back to the previous law that I had. Oops, I went the wrong way. So do you have any comment? No, thanks for sending the uh, name of the book that you mentioned. Um, I think that's enough for now because it's quite disturbing, actually. But thanks for the info anyway. Right. So, yeah, I did dig into this previously. Okay. I have dug into this on previous shows. But this one is very, very clear. And as I said, if you can go into um, some other books, it's, it's unambiguous. You're allowed to have sex. In fact, uh, maybe I should bring up, let me bring up one more. I'm going to bring up one more reference. Um, just so we deal with this issue. Um, um, Just give me a sec. Okay. Oh, bugger. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, on acting and the ruling of marrying young girls. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here. This is from Islam QA. This is the largest Islamic advice site in the world. They put fatwas up and they are drawing their advice from the Sharia manuals that I've just showed you. Okay, so what is the rule of Islam? What's the ruling of Islam acting in movies? What's the legal ruling based on the law, on the religion, right? And also, Actually, marriage has taken place between the persons who have even a little maturity. But in the case of children, can you justify this ruling of Islam, child marriage? This is a Muslim asking. Okay, this is Fatwa number 22442. I can send you guys the link. In fact, I've given out the links in previous shows. And um, Harry, if you have all that, just send the link to the, to the database and everything. But marrying a young girl before she reaches the age of adolescence is permitted in Sharia. It was narrated that there was scholarly consensus on this point. Okay, and it says, for those who have no courses, no periods, when your wife, for those girls or women who have no periods, i.e. they are still immature, their, their idda, their prescribed waiting period is three months as well. Allah has made the idda, which is a waiting period after puberty, right, um, after the period, in the case of a divorce of a girl who does not have periods because she is young and has not yet reached puberty, three months. This clearly indicates that Allah has made this a valid marriage. It was narrated that the Prophet married her when she was six and he consummated the marriage with her when she was nine. Right? The Prophet married Aisha, blah, blah. He repeats that. Now he says here, if the husband and the guardian agree upon something that will not cause harm to the girl, then that may be done. If they disagree, then Ahmad Abu Ubaid said that once a girl reaches the age of nine, the marriage may be consummated even without her consent. Right? But that does not apply in the case of one who is younger. That's so nice of them, but it's not true. The marriage may be consummated when the girl is able for intercourse, which varies, so no age limit can be set. This is the correct view. Does that make sense? Wow, man. 
Yeah, I think uh, get real, got it real, so he left or something. Um, but uh, we have Nafe who wants to probably sure. ask another question. Sure. Yeah. Nafe27, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, ah. I do actually. Um, in terms of what is what a put its spirit spirituality compared to this or again please are these just religions that are just all made up to divide and conquer us more and communism was made up to to join us and to give us peace and prosperity right no of course not did you have a question did you have a Something relevant to the topic? Hi, I'm uh, I'm uh, Miss um, Partner. So my my questions um, I was going to ask about with religion, um, but after listening to um, your speaker, just absolutely has uh, gobsmacked me and like just blow my mind uh, my question was going to be um, about spirituality being more spiritual is that something uh, just really what your thoughts or your speaker's thoughts were on that side of religion do you class it as a religion um, but actually listening to what he was talking about you know has made it like it's really not much of a question after listening to what he's been saying thank, thank you okay yeah. you, you want to comment on that or anything um islam doesn't classify itself as religion islam classifies itself as a deen um just to just to quickly run through this again i've done this many times but it's i realize i do have to repeat a number of things christianity is a religion, right? So if you think of how to find your relationship with God, right? Judaism is a religion, right? How to, how to create a relationship and follow the will of God, okay? However, there are certain differences. Islam, we call it religion because it's convenience, because we, we think it's similar to what we know, which it's not. And they call it religion because we've called it religion because it hides and camouflages its actual nature. Islam is a deen. D -E -E -N or D -I -N. you will see that they use this all the time remember the sharia for britain all those wonderful protests they have with the banners of sharia for britain well then you're going to be able to shag all the three-month-old girls that you want once that happens right and i hope you don't want that now dean let's look at what a dean is okay so this is from the oldest and most famous of the islamic dictionaries called the lisan al arab it's 20 volumes it's hundreds of years old okay it's um okay so it provides four meanings for the term deen. Let's look. The first meaning is subjugation or dominance. It is administrative or legislative authority. Now, Christianity does not issue parking tickets. Islam does. So it's the religion of parking tickets, the religion of beheadings, the religion of sales and negotiations and contracts because nothing outside of the religion. Okay, it's not a religion. It's administrative and legislative authority. So it encapsulates very firstly subjugation, the first meaning of Islam, right? The first meaning of itself as a religion, as a deen, is subjugation. Second, dominance. Then, administrative authority, right? Then, to put pressure to be obedient using power to enslave or to make one obedient. I subjugated them so they obeyed me. They give us here this lovely little quote to explain how they mean Islam is to be applied. I subjugated them, both Muslims and non-Muslims, so they obeyed me. Those who are ruled or governed upon, it's a, it's a political system first, coupled with all of the administrative and legal apparatus. Okay, So we've got subjugation, administrative, legislative, put pressure, enslave, obedience, and subjugation. Okay, so we've got like, what? Seven meanings, okay? A dayan is someone who 
dominates and rules over a state, nation, or tribe. So we've got like seven or eight meanings in the first level of meaning. The first meaning has about seven or eight specific things. Let's have a look at the second level of meaning. Obedience, bondage, subordination, domination by someone, and bearing humiliation under subjugation and power of others. Bearing humiliation and subjugation under power of of others. So if you want to ask, is religion designed to subjugate and dominate us? Well, Islam for sure is, because it says so in black and white. As stated, deen, now notice it says here, deen does not mean religion, it means obedience. So we've had like 10 or 11 definitions now, and we haven't seen religion yet. Now let's look at the third level of meaning. The third meaning is rules, regulations, ideology, doctrine, custom, tradition, and finally, or, or religion. So now you've got about 15 different meanings before you get to religion as a meaning of Islam. Do you understand? Islam was 15 things before it's a religion. Hopefully that clarifies. Uh, Harry, your thoughts? He does. It's very clear. Very clear. I, I would like to allow one more question before sure. you go on. Sure. Uh, Mar Margaret, please go ahead. Okay, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, I have a multiple part question, but I'll premise with that I was raised uh, Church of God and Baptist, but in a heavily Orthodox and um, Catholic area, the two. So it was almost like a hierarchy, and the Church of God and the Baptist religions were uh, much more free. It, you you concentrate more on your own what was the question spiritual, spiritual connection with god well what i'm saying is i i didn't grow up around muslim religion but i became very curious mm -hmm. i took philosophy class and then um uh, i i listened to a lot of um ayan hirsi ali as mm -hmm. well and it seems like you just stated that it's more law when it comes, it's almost like these different hierarchies. So Catholic, very ritualistic and more law based. Um, the Christian Muslim church doesn't well. doesn't dictate juridical law. So it's canon law, which doesn't issue parking tickets or tell you what taxes to pay, right? Right. It doesn't do zoning of your village, right? Whereas Islam does. Everything is inside the religion. It is a religion of law. And if Islam is a religion of law, we have to ask ourselves, what is its law? And I'm laying out that because my expertise is in Islamic law. And there is nothing yeah. outside of Islamic law. I mean, hopefully okay, this is making um, clear. Yeah. yeah in case anyone's in, so. sorry, in case anyone's wondering, I'm a, I'm a dyslexic, agnostic, insomniac myself, which means I lie <laughs> awake all night wondering if there really is a dog. Oh, okay. <laughs> I get it, but there's obviously, you know, between birth and, and the completion with death and everything, there is energy or spiritual connection or universal connection, just with universal law. Or, no, you know, the, the average the Muslim, the average Muslim has denied what's called the Kalam, right? Scholastic knowledge, they call it. They call it under different names. They use code and they use euphemisms. The average lay Muslim has denied scholastic knowledge. He's denied the Kalam, which is the knowledge of the religion, the actual spiritual knowledge. He has to follow the regulations. As I've laid out here, these regulations of the deen, he has to follow and shut right. his mouth. Right? Whereas right. the... I feel these, like Catholicism yeah. is similar. Yeah. Um, look, you know. everyone... Look, I'm not a Catholic, but everyone talks a lot of... Right. Excuse my French. Talk shit about the Catholic Church. And they don't know shit themselves when they're speaking. Right? Now, yeah. now look. Of course, well, as we know, but, but I need, I need to Catholic point out that the Protestant churches are perfect. Sinless. Holy. No Catholic, sorry, no Protestant has ever committed a sin. No Protestant priest has ever done anything wrong. It's the perfect church, sinless. They walk on water. So, but they all want to be the Catholic church, which is why they're all trying to take down the Catholic church. Look, I'm not a Catholic. I'm a Protestant. I was raised in, raised in the Church of England. Okay. But, <laughs> but yeah, I just like to look at history. So, uh, look, the Catholic church has certainly gone astray. That much is true. But then if we start taking a look into the Protestant churches, you're not going to like what you find either. Sorry, um, I, I kind of spoke over you there, but the, what is the question? What is the question? I mean, because everybody takes time to bash the Catholic Church because stop bashing Islam, you know? We don't want to talk about that, that kitty fiddling stuff. We've got to look at the, the no, Catholics. We've got to take I'm them not, down, you know? Yeah, sorry? Listen, 
I'm not bashing any of them. I'm talking about the progression within society as, yes. Sorry. as religions do. Some are more strict, you know, the same as other political systems that are put into place yeah. when it comes to controlling uh, society. Well, so the thing is, look, we have police. Do you want? Are you one of the abolish the police things because they control society? Would you prefer just rampant lawlessness like happened in South Africa recently? Is that good? Because oh, that, that was that was that was uncontrolled not. society. I feel like there is like a moral standard that that needs to be uh, on met on a certain level to where you're not impeding on someone else's freedom or life or or anything else. That's just a basic moral. But getting to my question, in a way, because it kind of feeds off of what you're saying with um, the pedophilia and and the laws. Um, and I know in Ayan Persiali's experience that she had, which I, I really didn't know much about this besides our regular practice of circumcision, but it's not a religious ritual. Here. It is a religious ritual. It's required. Religion circumcision is obligatory within Islam, and they no, will lie. They will lie to you about it whole day, every day. Sorry. In American culture, it's more of a medical. So procedure. It's circumcision. It says here within the Islamic law, section E four point three. It says here circumcision is obligatory for both men and women. This is a complete wow. misapplication. Yeah. That's and he's lying. The, the the translator is lying through his teeth here. I can tell you, the translator is lying out of his mouth with this statement, <laughs> where he says the buzzard of the clitoris, okay, not the clitoris itself. The buzzard is the clitoris, not the prepuce, as some mistakenly assert. This is a lie. The author lies in this book. He fudges. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was kind of my question about the whole the ritualistic part of the genital mutilation and how that plays into law, and what good does that do or or what is what is their excuse because for... women are subjugated in islam okay so hold on um so okay okay so let's women are worth only okay so let's have a look here um this gets look this gets long and complicated so, so look please get to your point quickly okay um the indemnity for the death or injury of a woman is one half of the indemnity paid for a man. Now notice when they say woman, they mean a Muslim woman. So understand there's all this crap's written in code. Okay, they write this in code. They mean a Muslim woman is worth one half of a Muslim man. The indemnity paid for a Jew or Christian is one third of the indemnity paid for a Muslim. Okay, so a Jew or Christian is worth, legally speaking, a third okay but a zoroastrian is only one fifteenth of that of a muslim now that's of course if someone happens to apply the law they may not understand it's like things get a little lax sometimes so women are to be subjugated w women are like cattle okay we can go i mean if i start going through a discussion on women which will be for a different day because then I, I keep wandering into different territory but you'll see that women are literally cattle okay Women are not to be treated with the kind of respect you treat a man. Women are a completely different beast. Right, but what you just stated was that men and women are are subjugated to genital mutilation. Circumcision for men, but mutilation for women. Because, I mean, people get circum men get circumcised all the time. Not me. I'm not going to show you, but, um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Thank moving you. on. Um, Thanks. Lloyd, I would like to yeah. try uh, to give a few more opportunities sure. for questions. Okay. It's the first time that people are like really into it. Okay. Uh, cool. Cool. Jana, Sorry, Margaret. Jana, um, please go ahead. But please make a very quick and direct question. Yeah, make it a question, please, not a lecture. Yeah. Jana. Uh, can okay, you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Can I ask you where did you get this information from? Because uh, this is completely incorrect. There is no genital mutilation in Islam for women. Well, you're the world's most famous Islamic Sharia law manual just said so. So I don't know, speak to the author. Speak to Al Azhar University, who is the highest Islamic seminary on the planet. And they've said that this is completely, completely in accord with Sunni Islam and Sunni doctrine. This is incorrect. This is completely incorrect. No, you're incorrect. wrong. And by the way... So uh, let's have a look. Let's have a look at the certification of Al Ashar University, which is the highest Islamic seminary on earth. Okay, it's the most highly respected, oldest, most prestigious Islamic university 
in the world. Let's look at their certification. So this is the certification. If you can get me your certification from al -Azhar in the meantime and just send us a copy in the chat, I'd love to see it. But let's have a look. So al Azhar Islamic Research Academy, from the, this is the world's most popular Islamic law text. We certify that the above mentioned translation corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community, the Al Asunna wa Al Jama. There is no objection to printing and circulating it. And this is from the General Director of Research Writing of the seal, and it has the seal of Al Ashar, and here is the Arabic. Okay, so, and then of course we have others as well. There are other warrants of authenticity, but this is from the best, the most highly respected Islamic university on earth now which one yeah. are you going to use show me your certification please i think it will be a waste of time if you want to give evidence um, then please send me in, in a private message and if it's uh, worthy of our time we are going to challenge uh, lloyd about it yeah please uh, do meet. please do go ahead i'd love to see it yeah meet please go ahead meet oh my accent Okay. Um, Spell it by letter by letter. <laughs> M Y T H. I cannot pronounce myth, the myth. T H properly. Myth. <laughs> yeah, well, he's probably not here. So kindly go okay. ahead. Look, understand, this stuff is taken from Islamic sources. These are because understand everyone Muslims want you to look at the Quran and they want you to look at the Hadith. Forget those. Those are almost irrelevant. Okay? They have their place. But let's view them, let's regard them as entirely irrelevant. Those are the nascent seeds that spawned a forest. Okay, and you're busy focusing on that seed, you're missing the forest. The Sharia and the Fiqh, which we are looking at, are the, are the product of Islam, the final product, the, the perfection of what Muhammad brought, the perfection of what Allah wants to establish in the world. This is it. This is, notice it is illegal for you as a non Muslim to have this knowledge. You're not allowed. Islamic law forbids you from having any of this knowledge hold on so let me actually let's actually actually let's actually just go look for that okay sorry here we go so understand this is one example i'm going to just go to this one example it is illegal for non-muslims to have access to islamic texts according to islamic law if a quran is being purchased for someone it is obligatory that the person be muslim the same is true of books of hadith and books containing the words and deeds of the early muslims Quran in this context means any work that contains some of the Quran, even a slight amount. This ruling holds for any religious books, even the Tabakat of Sharani, which is a collection of biographical sketches of Muslims. It is illegal for you to know this. It is not meant for the ears outside of the Ummah of Islam. Understand? Yes. It is not legal for me to share this because, and um, actually, you know what? I will have to, let me actually get to this. So this is slander because what I'm doing would be, would be called in Islam slander, would be khibba and namima. I am committing the crime of slander and of backbiting. Those are the two things that I'm guilty of. Muslims must present, must prevent this and they must not believe it. That's within the law. Okay. In Western law, to slander someone is to lie about them. Okay. To tell an untruth that smears and damages them. In Islam, slander is to tell the truth about someone. So let's say I say, I say Harry's been been Harry's been banging his secretary at work on the desk three days a week, okay, and that's a lie. And his wife finds out, and the family finds out, and now this damages Harry's reputation. He sues me for slander and defamation. In Islam, if I say that. Muhammad has been banging his secretary on the desk and it is true. He has been doing it. We have videos, we have footage, we have recordings, we have pictures, we have 20 eyewitnesses and we say it, that's slander. Why? Because slander in Islam is to tell something that someone wouldn't like known. It's the complete opposite. So I am committing slander right now. Yes, Harry? No, oh, please, please go ahead. Actually, let me prove my point here. Let me actually prove my point because then they are to uh, slander. Let's actually, okay. Obey oh. not every, yeah? No, no, sorry. I just, uh, we just have another question, but go sure. ahead. Sure, sure. No, no, have the question. Go ahead, yeah? Go, please go ahead. Have the, have the question come up. I can always get to slander again. Yeah. <laughs> Jake, please go ahead. Please, Jake. Hiya. Um, 
So my question is, are you ready to present this to um, the physical realm en masse? I have, you are. I have worked with various organizations. The last show that I did, I read a document which I have presented to an organization which is active in politics. They, they do lots of advocacy work within European as well as in our recently American politics within the American political realm. And in fact, I can assure you that that document that I, that I presented the last time talking about the Muslim Brotherhood, their aims and their methods, that actually did land on, as far as I'm told, on Ted Cruz's desk as part of a, uh, as part of a, of a policy framework that they provided him to discuss the Muslim Brotherhood. So my work went into that. So I have been providing information and working with people on this. So yeah, I do okay. lots of, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm uh, in contact with uh, military um, personnel regarding uh, satanic ritual abuse in North London, Hampstead. I'm not allowed to mention the um, okay. school. I'm on, I'm on a gagging order uh, due to I'm close friends with the mother of the case, you may know. Mm -hmm. And like you say, that's the uh, Church of England. Um, so yes, yeah, these, these satanists and um, I don't know how the Muslim fits into it, but this goes back a long way. And basically what I was, my point is, is that this is you're going to get an opportunity and there's many other people I know that have got near on perhaps in the same amount of knowledge as you've got and thankfully thankfully people have done the work because um for, for instance the very simple one in sara uh 4 34 where the mm -hmm. third time if if the woman disobeys oh. the man it she he is requ requested to strike her and in brackets it stupidly says in these new translations lightly as if that's you know okay yeah of, let's um, have a look at that so let's have a look here okay so yeah, also you know, with them um, there's a woman over here that's just been killed by a policeman um if mm -hmm. it's all true but the point is is that the, the 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 idea that we can be hand i've been given now um i've been given a quran by muslims trying to convert me here where i live in luton and mm -hmm. um and basically they you know they they're giving out a book which which requests that you hit a woman your your partner she should disobey you yet we we're not allowed to hit women or children or other men right. in this country do you know what i mean it's against the law so things have got to it's got to change so sharia law is above western law it's the law of allah it's perfect okay now if sharia law is so perfect if it's so amazing why aren't muslims shouting it from the treetops from the from the roofs Right? Why are they not making it public and showing just how good it is? Let's have a look. You spoke of 434, which is uh, the verses of wife beating. Let's have a look. This is in the section. So within the Islamic law, it's in the section on dealing with a rebellious wife. When a husband notices signs of rebelliousness in his wife, okay, signs of, not that she is rebellious or has done something rebellious, but he fears that there may be a rebellion, whether in words, when she answers him coldly and when she used to do so politely, or he asks her to come to bed and she refuses because a Muslim woman is not allowed to refuse sex to her husband. She is under obligation, she's legally under obligation to drop whatever she's doing and go and service him immediately. Okay? So it says here that he may hit her. Okay? He may hit her. Now, of course, the translator does put in things that are not in the original Arabic. He fudges a bunch of things here, so don't believe everything you read here. Okay? He may hit her. Okay? But he says, don't break bones, don't wound her or cause blood to flow. Well, yeah, when you, start, when you start beating someone up, how do you beat up someone a little bit? Okay? Now, notice he may hit her whether she is rebellious only once or whether more than once. In other words, he may hit her the very first time she is rebellious. Okay? The very first time. Now, how he defines rebellious is up to him, right? Or whether more than once, though a weaker opinion holds, then he may not hit her unless there is repeated rebelliousness. So the major opinion is hit her the first time. Okay? The major one is it is not, also it is not lawful for a wife to leave the house except by the permission of her husband. Now that is under the full application of Sharia law. Sharia law is modified by a number of doctrines. Okay, a number of doctrines that there's, Every single rule in within Islamic law can be modified, can be altered. Okay, so the main doctrine, so everything falls. The main doctrine in Islam is called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. So application of the Sharia and forbidding or preventing anything that violates the Sharia. But under that, you have the doctrines of Rukhsa and Azima. There are no, there are no radicals and there are no moderates in Islam. They, that does not exist. There's, that distinction is false. There's Rukhsa and there's Azima. Rukhsa, no. Azima is strictness, the doctrine of strictness. It is to do a thing the way it must be done, perfectly according to the letter of the law. The Muslim who runs onto London Bridge and stabs people to death, he is acting in accordance with Azima. He is doing Islam perfectly, 
correctly, exactly as the law requires, right? But that is only binding upon a small minority. As long as those people perform this act, right? As long as those people perform that act, the obligation, the crime of the non-commission of Azima is lifted from the rest and they will not fall into hell. Their souls will not be forfeit. Rosa is dispensation. It's a relaxation of the laws, okay? This is a relaxation of the laws where the rest of the Muslims have to provide some kind of assistance, but they don't have to perform azima. They don't have to do it strictly. That's just for a few. Now understand there are 14 different kinds of jihad, not just one. There's 14 different kinds. So your question is, what kind of jihad are they doing? They're doing something. Which one? Right? So azima just means that, so you have your moderates who are actually just azima. And at some point they can flip their rules, which define when they will flip into azima. Okay, so understand the strictness and relaxation of the rules. Dispensation, strictness and dispensation. That's all. There is no moderation. It's all proper Islam because for both, for following both doctrines, and the one is more important than the other, but for following both doctrines, they receive reward from Allah because both are viable, legitimate doctrines of worshipping Allah. Uh, hopefully that clarifies a little bit. Any, any, any further questions? Uh, uh, Lloyd, I, I feel a little uncomfortable I mm. muted Jana, probably a Muslim, okay. and I know you don't have a lot of patience, but Sorry. we are all about free speech here. I, I would like to allow her to come sure. online again for a second. Maybe she has an argument, or maybe she can okay. actually try cool. to dis disprove something. Okay. If she can make a, such an argument, I would like to allow that. Sure. One moment. Jana, if you like to speak and you can actually give evidence to your position, then you are welcome to say what you need. Jana? Maybe she will come later. Um, okay, yeah, so... Okay, now understood. Uh, okay, let's have a look. Since I didn't open my big mouth on this, let me, let me go into slander. Here's an example of the application of the law of slander in Islam. If he notices something good, it is sunnah, it is a good habit, okay? Because remember, the Sunnis follow the sunnah, the example of Muhammad and the companions, right? If he notices something good, it is sunnah to mention it. Great. But if he notices something bad, it is unlawful to mention it. This is slander. Now, Harry, is this the Western understanding of slander? Absolutely not. What do you derive from, from this? It's the exact opposite, precisely. It's slander. So don't say something unless it benefits the Muslims. Because let's ha let's have a look where we found this. Let's let's have a look where we where did we find this? Okay, okay. So let's continue. Let's go back to slander, and slander. Okay, uh, hurting or reviling Muslims. You're not allowed to hurt or revile Muslims. No, 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 no. Can't do that. Okay, but let's continue here. Now the definition of slander is in Book R under holding one's tongue. Keeping your mouth shut, you kafir, you, you non-Muslim, you, that's you. So hold your tongue, okay? Slander, the meaning of slander. Let's go have a look at that, okay? Let's, let's, go, and, let's go look at the, the formal definition of slander. Ah, there we go. Slander. Slander means to mention anything concerning a person that he would dislike. Is that the Western definition of slander? Harry? No, 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 no. It, it's not, slander in Islam is not to tell a lie, it's to tell the truth. This I'm telling, is so, it, it's unbelievable. Where do you get Jana, this information? One second, Jana, please. I allowed you to speak. Slander, but if you, if backbiting you evidence, is not allowed. Backbiting, do you know what backbiting is? I'm going to read it for when you from your own. Say something bad about something which, you know, which doesn't benefit anyone. Gossip, can you show me from the fiqh, please? Allowed. If you can show me which school of which school of fiqh do you follow, please? Which school of fiqh? So type in the chat, please. Which school of fiqh you follow? Okay. I don't and have to type anything. The, the, which you school are of fiqh? spreading lies, complete lies yes. that that non-Muslims can't access this information. They can access Quran is available to everyone. Yes. Sunnah, everyone can read. This information is so, incorrect and unbelievable. You're so, spreading give lies. Specific, one second. No. Jana, give specific evidence to his lies. 
and dis dispute what he says. Give no. us the scriptures. Show he us the evidence. He has no clue. He has no clue. I'm it, reading. It, it, I'm reading from the most... Spread the gossip. So here we go. Backbiting. Anyone what is the Islamic else. name for... Spreading Jannah, gossip. What is the Islamic name for backbiting? What is the Islamic name, please? Give me the Islamic name for backbiting. I'm all ears. It's, You're giba. Giba. it's what? Yeah. No, riba is slander. What's the Islamic name for backbiting, please? What's Is the Islamic back, uh, uh, name? For back, you're, you're an expert. You're an expert. You're the no, expert. You no, 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 no. Me. We're waiting for you. Obviously. You just you gave me the wrong name. You are an expert. Tell me. You just gave me ribba, which is slander, which is wrong. What's the Islamic name for backbiting? Come on, look it up. Come back to me in a moment, okay? So, if you can put her on mute for a minute, please, Harry. Yes, I did. So, okay. tail bearing is known as namima, okay? Just so you know. We can always check. Maybe I'm wrong. Hey, maybe I got it wrong. But tail bearing is not limited to that, but rather consists of revealing anything whose disclosure is resented. Okay? Tail bearing is anything whose disclosure is resented. Does that make sense, Harry? To me, it does. It's not telling stories. It's not talking crap about someone. It's not lying about someone. It's not gossip. It's revealing anything that is resented. And they resent the fact that I'm showing you what the Islamic law, the filthy dirty Islamic law says. Okay, let me just continue. There's a couple of other references here. So, revealing something confidential whose disclosure is resented. Remember, you're not supposed to know anything from Islam, right? So, this is resented. A person should not speak of anything he notices about people besides that which benefits a Muslim. Please, right. Please remind uh, the yeah. audience, what is the source for... Um, what this is called the Reliance for? of the Traveler. This is called the Reliance of the Traveler and the Tools of the Worshipper. Look it up. You'll find copies on archive.org, although most of the copies have been removed. They are removing these from archive.org and other sources on the net. They have been, but you can still find. Okay. Now, yeah. and I will, we will post these links. I did give you the, if you can just, re just go to the, just go to your chat and just paste all that stuff, the, the links and everything, please into so that everyone can have access. Yeah. yeah. If just anyone can have, quick, uh, sure. and I do it. I'm just, sure. um, well done is still here. Sure. And there was a really good website previously available not so long ago, Committee to Protect Muslims and Ex-Muslims, People Before Ideolo Ideologies, mm -hmm. and it was run by ex-Muslims that had escaped, um, and obviously the families would sometimes threaten to uh, right. you know, hurt them and stuff. Um, but it's the website's down, sadly. Um, Facebook's not working at the moment, so I can't see if that's working. Um, the only link I can find just now is via london.gov.uk they've got a link to it via um mm -hmm. you know uh, for domestic abuse and stuff like that right okay now back to namima tail bearing it says here revealing something confidential whose disclosure is resented okay so now i'm resented for disclosing the secrets of islam because it's embarrassing to islam a person should not speak of anything he notices about people besides that which benefits a muslim does this benefit muslims no it does not Okay. Now, notice the prohibition says here, disbelieve it. They have to disbelieve everything I say. Say, for tail bearers are corrupt and their information is unacceptable. Does, does this line up with her behavior and statements? Harry? In the meantime, it does. But Tell the tail bearer to stop. Kind of... Exactly. Admonish him about it and condemn the shamefulness of what he has done. Did she do all that? In the meantime, yes. Hate him for the sake of Allah, for he is detestable in Allah's sight, and hating for the sake of Allah is obligatory. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, can I ask a question sure. about the law? Please make it a question, and not a, not a long lecture, please. Oh my goodness, I was just giving background. I wasn't, it wasn't a lecture, I'm curious. I'm a curious person. So, when it comes to the law, we have had instances... And that goes against what John is saying, that there's been harm done to daughters being um, killed by their fathers. Yeah, that's legal. Yeah, that's fully legal. Everything yeah. else. So when it comes to the law and they're arrested for under Western law for committing crime, how does that relate to... In Islamic law, the what they've done is perfectly legal. In Islamic law, it is perfectly legal to kill your children. or grand A mother or father can kill their children, or a grandfather can kill their son's children. So a grand a grandparents can kill their grandchildren. It's legal. It's fully legal in Islam. Just don't ask me for the reference right now. You can just assume I'm lying if, you don't, if you're too lazy to look it up yourself. No, I'm I not going to search for it. But I've actually seen cases 
Uh, it's legal. No, it's fully right? legal. That's why it happens. This is why it happens. It's can fully I, legal. Yep. Hi, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, sure, please. Hi. So, yeah, that's really interesting. So, k ch killing your children uh, is legal. Is there, uh, like, do people, do judges consider, I mean, if it, if it even goes to court, do they consider the reason for killing? Um, that was kind of my question. Where Western law ends like what, and Sharia law begins? Or when like, like what if the father, what if the father, like, hates his child and tortures him and, like, does horrible things? Like, wouldn't that be, con like, how does that take it into consideration within the law? I have no idea within Islam. I don't think Western law um, accommodates Sharia law to an extent. I know they were trying to push more Sharia law type legislation um, to accommodate for religious. No, Sharia um, law runs contrary to Western law. It's contradictory to Western law. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. So uh, sure. Jana is uh, still raising her hand. Do you still have the patience to? No, I'm willing. I want evidence. I want evidence. I want names. She doesn't even know something basic. Look, she cannot even name. She's telling me about tailbearing, doesn't even know the Islamic name for tailbearing. Why would I want to speak with someone who knows less than I do on the subject, who is ignorant and clearly lying to me? I'm reading. I didn't make this up. This is the most famous Islamic law manual in the world. Okay, this is the number one Islamic law manual on the planet. What more resource am I supposed to get? We can go to others. There are others. You know, Okay. Okay. okay, so maybe I should you just go on with this. For so much. Maybe we can yeah. still go let's, back. To let's this. continue. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, let's just... Con okay, you know what? There's one more thing that I'm going to do within the Islamic law to explain because we were on that topic. I may as well just go there. Okay, so um, I do need to do this because just to finish the thread that we started. Okay, now understand here. Okay, what is obligatory knowledge? Okay, what is required to know? It's under under a section called personally obligatory knowledge. Okay, this would be Fad al Ain. Okay, obligatory, personally obligatory, Fad al Ain. Okay, versus Fad Kifaya, which I mentioned earlier. So, now seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. When they say knowledge, that, that means code, it's for various things. Okay, religious knowledge of a certain level. Now, the meaning of this hadith, although the hadith itself is not well authenticated, it is weak. The hadith is true. Now, it tells us here in section A, 4.2, and just so, by the way, I don't read and write Arabic, but there's plenty of Arabic to go with this if you want to, if you do read Arabic. Knock yourself out. The basic obligation of Islam and what relates to tenets of Islamic faith, it is adequate for one to believe in everything brought by the messenger. That's why she mentioned the Quran. Now, remember I've mentioned before, Islam is divided into two divisions and four levels. I'll skip the divisions. I'll go to the levels for, now, for the moment. The levels are the lowest levels called the Ibada. The next level is the Ishara. The third level is the Lataif. And the fourth level is the Qaik. Okay? That's technically, technically reserved for the prophets. But it is actually reserved for the highest level of the saints of Islam. The saints of Islam are Sufis. Okay? Don't let anyone tell you the Sufis are... The Sufis are the elite, the cream, the ultimate pinnacle of Islam. Right? Because they have mastered both the Sharia and the Hakika. Okay? The regulatory aspects of Islam as well as the occultic spiritual aspects of Islam. So the bottom level is where the lay Muslim finds himself, the ibadah, the literal, plain meaning, what's called the zahir, the external, the very first meaning that you perceive. Okay, There's are different levels of meaning called the batin, the internal, very subjective views. Okay, I can do this another time, I'll go into this in depth in another time. But your lay Muslim is at the bottom level called the ibadah. The ibadah level is literally called Islam for the masses. Okay, Islam for the masses. People like Jannah, who is not one of the ulama, who is not one of the leadership, as I mentioned earlier, right? One of the, the the scholars. She's not a scholar, right? So therefore, Islam for the masses. You are restricted to reading the Quran and some hadith. That's it. Okay. Scholars are not allowed to teach you what is called the kalam, the scholastic theology, the fine points of the fine points of the religion, because that will create doubt. Learning the religious aspects of Islam creates doubt, and doubt is Haram, okay? Because doubt will lead to you leaving, will lead to fitna, 
temptation away from Islam. Now, the basic obligation of Islam, that we'll get back to doubt in a minute, is to believe, and, and thus the Imams have to lie to the Muslim, but we'll get to that now. So it is adequate for one to believe in everything brought by the Messenger of Allah, right, with absolute conviction, free of any doubt. Okay, whoever does this is not obliged to learn evidence of the scholastic theologians. You're not obliged to learn evidence. Believe what you are told with total conviction, without evidence, and just shut the hell up. The Prophet did not require of anyone anything but what we have just mentioned, because people just believed Muhammad and didn't question. So therefore, it is sunnah for you to believe without question. So what if, so it says here, what befits the common people, okay, what befits the common people is to refrain, and also the lower level students, they're talking about the majority of those learning or possessing sacred knowledge. Now they're talking about this next level, the ishara, your lower level imams, right? Is refrain from discussing the subtleties of scholastic theology because corruption, difficult to eliminate, will find its way into your basic religious convictions. It is fitter for them to confine themselves to contentment with the above mentioned absolute certainty with no evidence. Your comment, Harry, before I go on. No, I don't have a comment. I understand everything. And I would really like to squeeze a little more information before you get too tired. So I would like sure. for you to go back to the main topic. Yes. Okay. But I mean, hopefully this was valuable to everyone. Hopefully you've learned a lot. Okay. It is. It's very important that once in a, a few sessions, we remind people what we are dealing with. And you demonstrated it so well tonight. Again. Yeah. Hopefully everyone's getting the impression. I might just know what I'm talking about. Right. Okay. So moving on. Now, let's have a look at the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. Now, there's lots of stories being told about it. And all of them are basically just lies and ignorance. But so... The first ecumenical council of the Christian church was in Nicaea, which is now Iznik in Turkey, because basically where all Paul's letters went are now Islamic. Hmm. Okay. It was called to the Emperor Constantine I, so he hoped a general council of the church would solve the severe problems created by Arianism, a heresy proposed by Arius of Alexandria. He was the Bishop of Alexandria. Now, Arius claimed that Christ is not divine, but a created being, which is precisely the claim that Islam makes. Exactly the same claim. Uh, for those of you who are sending me messages, I just can't deal with them right now. I will respond, if not tonight, because it's getting late here, tomorrow morning, but um, I, will, I will respond to you, okay? Thank you. So, Arius claimed that Christ is not divine, but a created being, just as the Quran says that Jesus is not divine, but a created being. Arianism was condemned as a heresy and the Nicene Creed was created in response to this heresy. Let's have a look. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Now, this we believe in one God against the Gnostics. Islam claims that we worship three gods, right? Whereas we believe in a triune God, the Father, the Almighty, against the Gnostics. The Father is considered the Almighty. He's not some demiurge. He's not some evil, weak God who is lower than humans. Besides, if humans are higher than, than the God who made the world, and, and, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. It's like, can we make planets? Maker of, well, according to the Mormons, yes. So, maker of heaven and earth against Gnostics, okay? Because the monad made the spiritual realm, the pleroma, and of course, the earth is this world of evil, accursed matter, which a demiurge, an evil God made, a weak, evil God, right? So, maker of heaven and earth against the Gnostics, of all that is seen and unseen against the Gnostics. So he is the almighty God who encompasses, encompasses both realms. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God against the Gnostics, eternally begotten of the Father against the Arians and adoptionism. Adoptionism was, oh Jesus, you've done such great works, you've done such a great job, you know what, here's a, here's a little reward, I'm going to make you into a deity. Good job, good job, off you go to heaven. That's adoptionism. Right? Whereas we say here he's eternally begotten of the Father, so he's part of the, the triune Godhead. Right? So God from God, light from light, and I'll just continue, I'm not going to spend the whole day on this. So he will come again, blah, blah. So you can see here, every single line is specifically written to deal with a particular heresy, and any future heresies that they would come up with as well. Okay? He's worshipped and glorified, so Jesus is to be worshipped and glorified. You saw in Gnosticism, Jesus is not a supreme being, and therefore he's not worshipped and glorified. He's one of the lower beings. In Islam, Jesus goes to the second heaven, Muhammad goes to the seventh heaven, right? He has spoken through the prophets and so on, and we believe in one, blah, blah. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a very quick run through of what the Nicene Creed was for, but it's a refutation of heresies. Okay? 
He was born of the Virgin Mary. The Docetists and the Ebionists were all against this idea that Jesus was born, that the Spirit could become flesh. This was heretical to them, right? Whereas the church said, look, this is what's in the doctrine of the New Testament. This is what we read from the prophecies of the Old Testament as they continue through. And here's the fulfillment of those prophecies and the completion of those. And now we have a new covenant. And this was a refutation of these ideas which are anti-Christian, right? He was crucified. He suffered death and was buried. Whereas the Docetists were saying it was a phantasm. He never had a spirit body. He never had a physical body, just spirit. So he could not have been killed. It would be too shameful. And Islam says the very same thing, that it was too shameful for God to die on the cross. So therefore, this could not have happened. They have a slightly different spin, but the, the, the essence is the same. So instead, so that is what the Nicene Creed is. It's very obvious when you read it. It wasn't about the church was created. It's, no, they were saying, look, these are heresies. This is our orthodox doctrine. Okay. Okay, now I want to briefly go to this tab here. And I want to go here. So have a look at this. This is from the Akida al Tahwiyah. Just as we have a creed, the Nicene Creed, which I've just shown, it's one of the Christian creeds, Catholic Church, Anglican Church as well, um, Protestants, right? Uh, which is the basic foundations of faith. Muslims have the basic foundations of faith called the Akida, the Creed. And we say, now notice, have you ever heard the words, Allah knows best, Harry? I actually did, yeah. All the time, right? Because it's told in their creed. In fact, it's number, well, it depends where you look. It's usually number 75 within their creed. But it says, we say, Allah knows best regarding matters, the knowledge of which is unclear to us. It's phrased slightly differently in other representations of this. But within the Islamic creed, they are told to say, when we don't know, what do we say, everyone? We say, Allah knows best. They are taught to say this. It's an admission of ignorance. But also, they are forbidden to ask questions about it because it would lead to doubt. So they are just told to accept with no evidence. I just pointed that out. They are not expected to be given evidence. They are told to just keep your mouth shut and believe what we tell you. Does that all make sense, Harry? Uh, um, Jana is trying to send some evidence to the 99% channel. Unfortunately, I cannot see what she's sending because the telegram is so slow. Maybe okay. you can look at it and respond to it, please. I don't know if 99% you know, channel. You. Okay, so let's yeah. let me just go down to the bottom. There is an image Jenna. or something that you can't. She's trying to. Cannot see it. No, she's trying to load an image. Let's see. Yeah, it's not coming through. It's just uh, okay. So I'm trying to load it, but no, it's not coming through. Okay, I'm not certain what it is. Again. Okay. Yeah. So let me just get back to where I was. Okay, now, a couple of... I just seen, yeah, sorry sure. to I just seen what she's posting, and she's citing the uh, the adopted uh, Jewish doctrine as, you know, he whoever kills somebody has killed all mankind. Um, that... So this, oh, that is such remember. bogus nonsense. That is stolen, that's plagiarized directly out of the Talmud, the Sanhedrin. That's from the Talmud Sanhedrin. Um, so... That is actually, you know what, shall we go there and just deal with that? Because she's just talking out of her butt right now. Excuse my French, I'm supposed to be a good boy. Yeah, um, let's deal with it. I, I want to show that we are not just uh, inventing things and that we are dealing with every challenge. Um, okay, hold on. Um, I don't understand why it doesn't load for me. I cannot see the image. Me neither. Maybe we've been banned, who knows. Uh, you're full of shit. Uh, Jana, now you're full out of the group. <laughs> uh, okay, so here we go. Okay, so, okay. So briefly speaking, so Quran 532 and Quran 533. So actually, let me go to Quran 532 and 33 first, just so we can get some reference points. Uh, okay. So let's go to 532. Let's have a look here. Okay, Quran 532. So Muslims deliberately and ignorantly, but deliberately, deceitfully, will misrepresent this particular Quran verse. Notice that 532 says specifically, 
we decreed, Allah decreed for the children of Israel. This is a ruling that applies to the children of Israel. It is plagiarism of Sanhedrin 5, um, Talmud Sanhedrin, and I'll get into that after this. So whoever kills a man, okay, unless for a soul or for corruption done in the land, which is fitna, it is as if he had slayed mankind entirely. And whoever saves one, it is as if he had saved mankind entirely. Right? Now, this does not apply to the Muslims. It doesn't even apply to the Christians. Notice, it is upon the children of Israel, specifically the Jews. Allah is stating this specifically for the Jews. We told the Jews, if anyone slays a person, unless it is as capital punishment for murder or for the spreading of mischief, capital punishment for the crime of drawing people away from your religion, for blasphemy. So unless you kill someone for ca as a capital crime for murder or blasphemy, it is as if you slew the whole people. And if you save one life, it is as if you have saved the whole life of the person. Okay, fantastic. We've got that. Let's go to 533. Now let's look at what Allah says to the Muslims. It says, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah. And waging war, let's not assume that you have your tanks and you invade. It's just that, do you worship Islam? No. You're waging war against the law, right? And those who strive upon the earth to cause corruption. Corruption would be more properly translated as temptation. And that is the Islamic fitna. Fitna is temptation. Temptation away. Just like you're tempted by a woman or tempted by a man. Okay? Uh, I'm not inclusive, so I'm not going to talk about gays here. That's, that's, that's outside of my uh, scope today. So, um, what you have is, that's temptation. And if you provide something that would tempt a Muslim away from Islam or cause doubt, right? That would also be corruption. That would be fitna. If you're causing doubt within the Muslim, then that person must be killed or crucified, their hands and feet cut off from opposite sides. Or if you want, if you're feeling generous that day, let, they be ex let them be exiled. So notice the Jews can kill, should kill, for blasphemy and murder as a capital crime, right? In court. But Muslims, if someone simply proselytizes another religion and draws Muslims away from Islam, doesn't even do anything bad, but they're just proselytizing, that person is killed or crucified, or their hands and feet are cut off from opposite sides. That's pretty disgusting. Okay, now let's go and have a look at what the Talmud Sanhedrin has to say. So Quran 533 is stealing from Talmud Sanhedrin 37a. You'll see different references here and there, but this is the link on safaria.org, Sanhedrin 37a. In fact, I can shorten this by just going here. There you go. Okay, Adam, the first man, was created alone to teach you that with regard to anyone who destroys one soul from the Jewish people, who kills one Jew, the verse ascribes him blame as if he destroyed an entire world. As Adam was one person from whom the population of an entire world came forth. And conversely, anyone who sustains one soul from the Jewish people, the verse describes him credit as if he sustained an entire world. That's why the Jews will always reward someone as righteous among the nations if they protect Jews. Now, this is both literal and metaphorical. If Adam were killed, right, according to the least within, within the Christian and Jewish tradition, if Adam were killed because Adam spawned the entire human race, there would be no humans. You would have then have killed the whole world. It is taken metaphorically to mean that if you kill a man, he has no offspring, he has no seed, and therefore all of his descendants will never exist. And it's a whole world full of people extrapolated over time. And thus murder is a severe sin. It's a severe crime. And it is to be punished if it is proven. Right, And if you save a man, you could then populate the whole world. Now, if you look at indirectly, if you look at the idea of Mormonism, that, that one man populates a world, that could be a corruption of this concept within the, within the Jewish religion. So you can see here. Now, correctly speaking, within the Talmud Sanhedrin, they speak of the bloods. Okay, The term is the bloods. Your brother's blood, your brother's bloods. They speak of the bloods, the many bloods, your offspring or your bloods. Okay, So that, that's what they refer to over there. Okay, so does that answer that question? Harry, does that clarify that? I guess, yes. Thank you. Okay. So now I shall continue. Unless there are any questions, but these questions really get carried away, don't they? <laughs> okay. Hopefully everyone has learned. Um, if you guys can, can let us know in the comments um, if that was helpful and useful and educational to you. Um, you know. And for those who dislike me, you can drop death threats and things so we can identify you and ban you. That would be appreciated. And... Um, you know, just put your death threats and other insults in the comments so we can uh, make sure that we block you on site. So, okay. Um, okay, now, Arianism. Why was the Nicene Creed created? Well, 
in response to Arianism, but also to deal with a bunch of other heresies, right? Heresies is anything that is opposite to the orthodox position. And of course, do you get people who are, who are, oh, man, I forget the word now, but people who's like, there's no, there's no ultimate truth. There is no orthodoxy. It's like anything goes, right? Um, there's a name for that. Uh, but the wokeists are like that. So Arianism, anyway, is a form of Unitarianism, thus anti-Trinitarian. So Unitarianism means that you believe in a singular God, not the triune God of the Christian faith. Now, he remained popular even after his beliefs were denounced as a heresy by the Council of Nicaea, right? There was a huge vote, and he was massively outvoted. So Eris's basic premise was the uniqueness of Allah, who is alone, self-existent, not dependent for existence on anything else, and immutable. And this is an exact description of Allah. So he held the position on Jesus that Jesus as the Son of God was a lesser being created by God. And the Son is no direct knowledge of the Father. This is exactly the same position held by Islam. Arius' teaching reduced the Son to a demigod and reintroduced polytheism since the worship of the Son was not abandoned. They also worshipped. So now you had two gods. Okay, so now you got polytheism. Right. And of course, um, let me see. In Islam... You need to believe in who? Muhammad. You can't just believe in Allah because actually, let me go back to the Sharia here. Because you see, belief in Allah alone is insufficient. Within Islam, you must believe in Muhammad. Okay? You must believe in Muhammad or you will not go to paradise. It is obligatory for you to believe in Muhammad. Let me actually go there and show that since I'm discussing this. I'm going to PQ. Are we we struggle to find this particular reference. P75, we're getting there. With the weight, really, just give me a second. I'm nearly there. Here we go, P75. <clears throat> okay, so understand, so just like Arius, let's have a look at what Islam says about this since we're dissecting Islam. Now, Within the Christian doctrine, if you look at the Gospels, right, it does state, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your might and all your strength. Okay? Now, you get similar you get similar narrations within the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, right? You shall love God with all your mind, all your heart and all your soul. Now, obviously, the greatest sin and the greatest crime within Islam, the one sin that Allah does not forgive is shirk, where you associate a partner with Allah, which is exactly what Islam does, right? Because, you see, believing in Allah alone is not sufficient, right? So... You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, blah, blah, blah. And no one shall go through the Father but through me, right? Those are the words of Jesus. No one shall go to the Father but through me, through faith in Jesus, right? Now, if you look at Islam, not loving the prophet more than all people. Now, they're understating this here, okay? They're understating this. The prophet said, none of you believes until I am more beloved to him than his wife, child, self, and all people. So... You are not a Muslim until you love Muhammad. Now, when he says self, that is code for your life. You must love Muhammad more than your wife, more than your children, more than your own life. And also they imply here your possessions, if you go and look through that. So your life, your possessions, your wealth, your property, and all other people. Nothing in this world must be more important to you and be more beloved to you than Muhammad. Because Muhammad's just a regular prophet like any other prophet. He's just a normal human being, just a warner, just a regular dude. And you're going to hell if you don't believe in him and love him more than you love your children. So, um, Harry, since you're at least culturally a Jew, um, do are Jews required to love Moses more than their own wives and children and to worship him and adore him and place him above everything in the world and everything in their life? I'm not an authority about Judaism, but definitely not. Absolutely not. So does that seem a little bit like worship? It does. Right? This is, it is. It is worship. So understand, you cannot reach Allah unless you love Muhammad. Okay, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and no one goes to the Father. So you shall love the Lord your Muhammad with all your heart and all your money and all your property and more than your kids, more than your mother, more than your father, more than your wife, more than your Porsche, okay, more than your bank account. And no one shall go to Allah except through him. Okay, love of the Prophet means the will to obey him and not disobey him. This is one of the obligations of Islam. Do what you say. Do, do what I tell you. Shut up. Does that clarify that point there? 
Any comment? You're very detailed. Let's see if we have any comments. <laughs> Guys, questions, comments, people who didn't speak yet. No, nothing in the meantime. Sorry, Margaret. Okay. So if I was doing this in writing, I would be promising you guys at least one spelling mistake every 60 seconds. So because I can't do that in writing, I'm at least trying to um, alleviate that issue by providing a little bit of sarcasm every two minutes or so. Um, it's given old joke a home week. If the jokes fall flat, because it's given old joke a home week, and I'm just trying to hand out a few so that just to keep you guys entertained. Okay, so moving on. Um, <clears throat> right. So now, hopefully you can now see a connection, at least some degree of connection between Islam, and I can go into depth on, on in different directions on this, between Islam and anti-Christian heresies, because Islam is explicitly anti-Christian. Now, Docetism, this was another form of Gnostic heresy, early Christian heresy, or anti-Christian heresy. It's from the Greek, dokain, to seem, right? Because it only seemed like Jesus was real. He, it was an illusion, right? He didn't have a physical body. He seemed to die. One of the earliest, you can think of it as, um, I identify myself as a six foot five blonde. Okay, might have heard that somewhere before. One of the earliest anti-Christian doctrines, Docetism, became an important doctrinal position of Gnosticism. It claimed that Christ did not have a real body. Okay, so I identify myself as a six foot five Japanese woman right now, very good looking one. Uh, if you guys are interested, drop me a number below. You guys heard of that stuff? I, I identify myself as? Uh, this has a basis already within, within Gnosticism. And we discussed it in the very first episode. So, reminder, Gnosticism is a religious dualist system of belief arising in the 2nd century, which says that matter is evil. And we've just read within the Sharia and the Fiqh that Islam says that the world is cursed, that the world of matter is cursed. Spirit is good. Okay, Allah is purely spirit. He cannot come to earth. And claimed that salvation was attained through esoteric knowledge. Esoteric means secret. Mystical means beyond reason. Something that is achieved through the senses, subjectively. Right? An experience. Right? That is an experience. That would be a... You can think of it as virtue signal. By saying that I identify with this experience. I identify with this feeling. Right? Feelings. The fifis. Esoteric means secret. Okay? And this is attained through esoteric knowledge or gnosis. And of course, that secret knowledge is all over Islam. So this heresy developed from speculations about the imperfection of matter. So some docetists have said that Christ was born without any participation of matter. Okay. And that everything he did, including the crucifixion, were just illusions. They were simply illusions. He was merely a spirit being and they, he gave the impression of these things happening. But he was not real. That's why the Nicene Creed had to state that he was born as a man, okay? They denied Christ's resurrection and ascension to heaven. Islam denies Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, but they do state that he ascended into heaven, okay? When you read the stories from the scholars, good grief, the whole, do it's hysterically funny, actually, it's a riot when you read them. So, the definition of esoteric, designed for, understood by the specially initiated alone. Don't forget I mentioned the different levels of Islam. So, the religion of Islam is specially for those initiated alone it's not for the lay muslim okay requiring exhibiting knowledge that is restricted to a small group the ulama again you've got this tiny group okay limited to a small circle docetism so i will finish in the next few minutes all right biblically early forms are alluded in the new testament such as in letters of john right where he says here many false prophets are gone out into the world Know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in flesh, is of God. In other words, when someone preaches that Jesus was born as a man, right? He participated in humanity, so the Spirit came down, participated in humanity, knows who we are, relates to us as people, right? This means that we now have a God that we can relate to Him and He relates to us. He's lived through our experiences. He knows what it is, knows our struggle. Right? But every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. So this would make Islam, well, for other reasons, for this and many reasons, Islam is anti-Christian, but Gnosticism, definitely anti-Christian. Right? So many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So Ebionism is from the Hebrew, Ebionim, the poor. 
So they believed in a single God, again, like Islam. They taught that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, how do we define the word Messiah, right? They speak of the true prophet mentioned in Deuteronomy 18.15. Now, within Islam, again, if I show you some of the notes, they accept that Christ was the Messiah, but Christ's role in Islam is the same as John the Baptist is in the New Testament. John the Baptist foretold the coming of Jesus. Jesus' job in the New Testament, according to Islam, according to the Quran and their sources, is that Jesus merely foretells the coming of Muhammad. Jesus is simply the guy saying, hey, there's going to be another prophet. His name's Mo. Wait for him. He's going to be awesome. Right? That's the whole story. Okay? That's the entire story. And while Jesus is acknowledged to be the Messiah, Muhammad is the King Messiah. The title Muhammad gets is the King Messiah. Okay? For instance, according to the Islamic scriptures, of course, Jews are circumcised on the eighth day. Is that correct, Harry? It's correct. Right, so Jews are, Jews are circumcised on the eighth day. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, like, like all believing Jews are, okay, practicing Jews. Muhammad, according to the narratives of Islam within his Gospels, the Sira, Muhammad is born circumcised, okay? He's born circumcised. He one-ups Jesus, okay? Because Muhammad is born just perfect. I have no idea how you do an in vitro circumcision, but hey, he got one, okay? So let's have a look here. So the first mention of these Ebionists is in the works of St. Irenaeus, notably in his Against Heresies in 180 AD. So they rejected the virgin birth of Jesus, claiming that he was the natural son of Joseph and Mary. Right? The Ebionists believed that Jesus became the Messiah because he obeyed the Jewish law. Now, of course, Jesus was tried by the, the Sanhedrin because he claimed to be the son of God, and that was punishable by death. So this is, if you read within, I think it's uh, John 19.21 or John 21.19, they state, we have a law, and that law states that if someone claims to be the Son of God, he must die. And thus, they convinced Pontius Pilate to have him crucified and killed, right? So the Jews at the time were not able to pass laws. In fact, because they were under Roman subjugation, they could not pass capital punishment on their own. They had to get permission from the Roman leadership. So they followed the law, but... They removed, now they claim they followed the law, like, like Islam claims to follow the Mosaic law, but they removed what they regarded as interpolations, and this is exactly what Islam does as well, in order to uphold their teachings, which include vegetarianism, okay, not Islam, holy poverty, well, technically the Sufis, but not really, ritual ablutions, oh, certainly Islam, and the rejection of animal sacrifices, which Islam does, and how Jerusalem in great veneration, which Islam does. So there's a lot of overlap between these pre-Christian heresies, or post-Christian heresies, sorry. They're all reactions to Christianity. Right, and I will end off on... Actually, you know what, should I just stop here? Take some questions and call it a night, because my throat's getting sore, and uh, Plotinus is a good one to stop on, because you can see the Plotinus... Plotinus is a pagan. He was a Greek philosopher from Alexandria. He despised Christianity. Now, now he's no friend of Christianity. If you can find him writing friendly things, that would be great. His student wrote a complete attack, a huge polemic against Christianity. He wrote an attack on the Gnostics again, right? But he was no friend of the Christian church, right? And he's the founder of Neoplatonism, but he created a concept of God called the One, okay? Plotinus. Plotinus is the One. And if you read through Plotinus is the One, the qualities of his God, and you read through Allah, they're like, they're buddies, they're twins, separated at birth. So, yeah, but I'll pause here. Um, any comments or questions from you, Harry? And I'll take some questions again. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so, just a small thing if you can do. Uh, do you have the image of the Kaaba uh, available just so we can be impressed with this uh, incredible arch architecture? Architecture? Oh, shit. Architecture? Architecture. <laughs> yes. Archi uh, you know, okay. let, me, let me find that for you. Uh, and if, you... if you can remind me the story about the father of Muhammad, about the name, something there. I, I, I remember it was funny, but I, I don't remember what what you were saying exactly about the name, the source of the name, maybe something like that. Uh, Father's Muhammad Abdullah. His name is Abdullah, which comes from before the, um, the, the creation of Islam, uh, because Ab Allah was a common name for, for gods in uh, pre-Islam. There's these three gods called Allah before the invention, the creation of Islam. Um, I'm just trying to find um, that picture of the Kaaba. So, yeah, I may not be able to get in on short notice because, man, i got so much material, it's like hard to remember where stuff is sometimes. I just have so much stuff, yeah? So, oh, I'm okay. Not, okay. I'm yeah. not dedicated to that for you. Just put me in the room. 
a, another small thing. Uh, not uh, the regular Kaaba, it's a particular picture of the Kaaba that I'm trying to get, a specific picture of the Kaaba. Yeah, yeah no, it's well... The, got one well, from a hundred years ago, which shows it in its true form. I uh, know, it's a recent one. Okay, hold on. You know what, let me find it. I think, uh, no, it's a specific picture that I want. Um, okay, let's actually just go... Okay, hold on. Oh, here we go. Uh, here we go. Here it is. Yeah. Okay, let me just lift. Let me just bring. There we go. This is the Kaaba in Mecca. This makes me. Doesn't just make you want to say Shahada right now, Harry? Looking at the glory <laughs> of this of this building, yeah. the holiest object in Islam. It's there. I just wanted to, to save that image. Um, anyway, uh, one, one small d detail. Um, since I removed Jana because she was disrespectful, uh, but I can finally see the, the image that she sent. Now, I'm not sure if you already uh, spoke about it, uh, but she's giving a, a quote from Quran, chapter 5, verse 32. And she's saying like that, terrorism has no place in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, whoever kills an innocent human being, it shall be as if he killed all mankind. And we said he said that to the one. Jews. He says that only to the Jews. Right? Again, please, what? He says that only to the Jews. And, and Allah speaks of jihad. Right? He doesn't speak of terrorism. He speaks of jihad. Yeah, I mean, of I'm course sorry, not. I, I, I was quoting it with some internal yeah, no. stuff. So no, he was I quoting did. five. She was qu quoting five thirty-two and five thirty-three, which I did, which comes out of Talmud Sanhedrin. She's lying. Okay, don't forget lying. Actually, you know what? Let's do that first. Let's go to lying. Lying in Islam is legal. It is compulsory. Okay, um, so let me do that. Um, I don't understand what you mean by the Jews. Uh, sorry. No, I, I... that verse of the Quran. Okay, yeah. that if you kill a man it's as if you killed the whole world when, that is a partial quote it's a misquote let me actually go here let me show you that is a misquote that's a deliberate misquote let's go to 532 you see she quotes from here whosoever kills a man okay whoever kills a man you see this she is completely okay what she is not doing is she's not putting in these words we decreed for the children of Israel. This is what I said earlier. See, we decreed wow. upon the children of Israel. It's for the Jews only, no one else. Allah decreed for the children of Israel. Is that the Muslims? No, it's the Jews. You see. Incredible. She's... You spoke about it earlier. Right? Yes, I did. You... I did. You were you yeah, were sorry, occupied. Uh, I... Yeah, I apologize for that. Okay. Um... I think Dave wanted to say something. Sure, Dave. Please go ahead. No, no you're good. I'm just please go ahead. Listening here. I'll post the um, the image up that I've got, which is equally as inspiring. If you would do that, please. But yeah, so this is this, as you can see. I mean, this just makes you want to just bump your forehead against the ground and raise your ass up in the air. Excuse my French. I shouldn't say that. Um, it just makes okay. you want to. Yeah, this is just incredible stuff. I I, I can't believe how you this. The Mona Lisa doesn't hold a candle to this. <laughs> uh, Nafe, you have a question again? Uh, please go ahead. No. Okay, right. Uh, any other yeah, questions, please? I do. Yeah? I do. I'll, um, sure. I want to ask how this is going to reflect on the global agenda and, and what state is Israel? The, uh, Israel is in a state of emergency now, so this is all reflected. So where where where, is, where do you go from now? Uh, could you just try that again? Could you just rephrase that if you would. Uh, yeah, not very well, probably. The, the point of Islam is to kill the Jews, so they to bring about the end times. It, what, go, what is going on in Israel is to kill the Jews. Am I, am I no, right Muslim. Not? No, Muslims are required to murder all the Jews to bring about the end times. So it's a matter of religious obligation and and religious duty for Allah to murder all the Jews 
And when they've done this, then Jesus will come back and Jesus will then kill the Christians who don't convert to Islam. He will destroy the church, right? He will break all the crosses and he will kill the pigs because then, because they will be no longer eating of haram food, which is crazy. Why did Allah make the pig in the first place then? Got to wonder, right? Besides that, um, they will then kill the Jews and then Muhammad will come back and the whole world, including Jesus, will then pray behind Muhammad and Jesus will then die have a family and die and everyone will live happily ever after as Muslims. That, that's written. Do you believe that will happen? They believe it. It doesn't matter what I believe it. It doesn't matter. I, what, the, that's the what masses, they believe. The, the huge masses they actually believe that. What an individual Muslim believes or not, who knows, but this is their doctrine. That's their written doctrine. That's what they're required to do to bring about the end times as, as loyalty and faith is to so kill the Jews. Is, yeah, uh, another question, cool guy, if you like to go ahead. Wouldn't it be a good thing if all the Jews died? Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> let's have a look at why he says this, okay? Because Muslims are required to hate the Jews. Understand, they hate Christians too, they hate you too. You're next. The Jews first, you're next, okay? Now, have a look here. This is the doctrine, this is the main doctrine of Islam, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, okay? So this is the primary doctrine in Islam. Everything else is a sub-doctrine of this, okay? Everything else. Now let's have a look, okay? Let's, and I've been through this before and I'm gonna repeat this probably in the future because you need to understand the pattern of escalation of violence within Islam. Now understand, even though this is a step-by-step -step process of violent escalation, they're not required to follow these steps. They can go straight from step one to step final, to step final, like that. No need to stop in the middle, okay? Understand. So, first of all, Muslims must have knowledge of the wrong act. So they must know their religion well enough to be able to say, that's wrong, I need to stop that. That is forbidding the wrong, and they are now commanding the right. When a Muslim commands the right, like what he just did, what he just said, okay? Now, what he just said, he was earning reward from Allah, okay? He was earning reward because it's, it's considered to be on par with doing jihad. Because, you see, a Muslim is only saved from committing sin, right? His words are only considered righteous when he's committing, well, when he's, his deeds are considered righteous, when he's killing in the name of jihad, when he's killing or being killed in the name of jihad for Allah, or when his words are done for the sake of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. That's the only time that a Muslim's words count for him and not against him. As they say within their scriptures, a Muslim's words only count for him and not against him when he's commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. So they must explain that something is wrong. They must politely explain and then they must forbid the act verbally. That's what Jannah did. Would you agree, Harry? Yes, I agree. Right. And then they must censure with harsh words. This means abusive language. Okay. Censure with harsh words. Abusive language. Did we just hear some abusive language? Yeah, that's why I removed her. She left it in the main channel. Right, and that's why this guy just said, what did he say? Think about that. He's, he's acting on behalf of Islam, right? So they must censure with harsh words. In other words, you must revile and abuse the person who is doing the speaking, okay? Then writing the wrong by hand. Now, how do you write the wrong by hand? Well, you break things, okay? You break things, you can hurt people, throw rocks. Okay, then intimidation. Notice it is required that they intimidate, then they must assault, and then they must utilize force of arms. Okay, so let's have a look at harsh language. Let's go to that section on harsh language, just so we can see how this escalates. And this is why Muslims, pardon me, become abusive. They are required to. Censuring with harsh words. The fourth degree of severity consists of reviling the person and bearing down on him with sharp, harsh words. Okay? So, okay, you are to revile. Revile means to insult. Okay? Ignore the fluff in the blue here. This is just fluff the guy stuck in there. Okay? So reviling him does not mean vulgarity and lies. No, it does. Vulgarity means, reviling means to insult the person. Okay? And then you must write the wrong by hand, such as breaking musical instruments, pouring out wine, okay? 
and then break the instruments just enough to stop them being used. That's so polite. That's so nice. It can break your stuff. If you cannot manage, except by throwing rocks at the bottles, then one may do so, and you're not obliged to pay for any damages if you break the things belonging to someone else. Then you must use intimidation. The religion of intimidation. The sixth degree is threatening and intimidation, such as saying, stop this or I will. Then, assault. The seventh degree is to directly hit or kick the person or similar measures that do not involve weapons yet. This is permissible for private individuals, like trucks, you know, swords, knives, things like that. And then force of arms. The eighth degree is when one is unable to censure the act by oneself and requires the armed assistance of others. This is the doctrine of the escalation of violence in Islam called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. And they can go straight to step eight immediately. They don't have to stop in the middle. I'll stop here tonight. How's that, Harry? Any comments? Any? Um, it's fine. I was hoping you will allow the last question. Sure. There is someone with his hand. Go and ahead. Find one more. Uh, Dove 18, can you go ahead, please? Yeah, I guess uh, we, are, we are done. Um, unless, of course, you have the patience to help me t and and uh, yeah. provide again the, the the scripture that says that uh, they are obli obligated to kill all the Jews and, and about uh, Jesus who comes back have to basically. Uh, dude, to seriously, no, it's gonna. That is. Uh, so okay. I can archive it myself. Okay, so. Okay, so, uh, let me just have okay. Oh, bugger. Okay, so let's let's do this now. Look, I, I'm not going to go into all of that, but let, let me go through some of the irrelevant quotations, right? So Allah gave permission to His apostle to fight at the second oath of Aqaba, right, which contained conditions involving war, which were not in the first act of loyalty to Muhammad, right, act of fealty. Muhammad's followers bound themselves to war against all and sundry for Allah and his apostles, while he promised for them faithful service, for thus the reward of paradise. So at the second, at the second, um, uh, what do they call it? This, this, the second oath of Aqaba, right? Muhammad's followers bound themselves for war against all of the enemies of Allah and Muhammad. And if you're not a Muslim, you're an enemy of Islam. I covered that um, in earlier shows. We discussed that. So, so let's have a look here. Let's have a look at what Tar Tabari says. Tabari tells us on Quran 969 and his interpretation of it. We are the helpers of Allah and the viziers of his messenger. We fight people until they believe in Allah. He who believes in Allah and his messenger has protected his life. But if you don't believe in Allah and his messenger, you have not protected his life from us. And one who disbelieves, we will fight him forever in the cause of Allah. And killing him is a small matter to us. Killing him is a small matter to us. Okay, let's have a look at the Hadaya. This is the largest of the Islamic Sharia manuals that I know of. It's four volumes. It's 2,652 pages. I have a copy if you want one. Okay, you can download it as PDF. It's fascinating reading. I'll tell you that. If Muslims attack infidels before inviting them to Islam and you slay them and you take their property, there's no fine, there's no expiation or atonement that are due because that which protects, namely Islam, does not exist in them. This is even more authoritative than the Reliance of the Traveler. It's a much bigger manual. So when scholars, now the Reliance of the Traveler is the common Sharia manual that's common across the world. Their Hedaya is studied specifically by scholars. When they go to the madrasa, when they go to the university to study, to become an imam or sheikh or whatever, in some of those courses, after five or seven years, this is the manual they graduate upon, the Hedaya. They graduate upon this. This Now, the main school of Islam, the main school of jurisprudence called the Hanafi, the Hanafis. This is the main book, the main Islamic law manual of the Hanafis. This is the pride of the Hanafi school. And it's huge. It's massive. It's way bigger than the Reliance. So, now, the destruction of the sword from the Hedaya, volume 2 again. The destruction of the sword is incurred by infidels. That's you. Although they are not the first aggressors, as appears from various passages in the sacred writings, infidels may be attacked without provocation. I can go into the Hedaya itself, I can load it and show you guys, but take my word for it, or you can just prove me wrong by showing me it doesn't exist in the book. Good luck. Umar, this is the one of the caliphs, one of the followers of Muhammad, one of his twelve apostles, believe it or not. 
Umar heard the messenger of Allah say, I will expel the Jews and the Christians from Arabia and I will leave none but Muslims. This is in their second canonical book of Hadith or collection of Hadith, Sahih Muslim. So the messenger of Allah, Muhammad very bluntly states that I will expel the Jews and the Christians from Arabia because Arabia was very much mixed. It was Jewish and Christian and Islam came afterwards and they literally did expel the Jews and Christians from Arabia. They're not your friends. Okay. And again, this is repeated in Sahih Muslim again. You, the Jews, should know that the earth belongs to Allah and his apostle, and I wish to expel you from this land, Arabia. And they are following these dictums. Now, here's another one, very interesting one. The apostle said, kill any Jew that falls into your power. Thereupon, Muhayyisa bin Masud leapt upon Ibn Sunayna, a Jewish merchant with whom they had social and business relations, and killed him. This is in the biography of Muhammad, the Sirat Rasulullah, page 369, entry number 554. Right, that's his biography. So understand, this is the example of Muhammad. When, when possible, this is what they should do. Now, this is the most famous of the hadiths in Sahih Muslim, right? One of the hadith that defines how they must treat the Jews. Abu Huraira reported that Allah's messenger said, the last hour, this is the final days, right? This is the, the, the return, the coming, the, you know, the apocalypse and all that nonsense. The last hour would not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews and the Muslims would kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind a stone or a tree, and the stone or a tree would say, Muslim, servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. But the tree Gatad would not say it, for it is the tree of the Jews. Uh, they mean the box thorn here. The box thorn. I remember that. <laughs> you spoke about that. So, I just wanted that to, to be archived properly on my database. Yeah, and yeah, so, so guys, uh, does that answer your questions? So far, at least, does that help to clarify? It really does. Thank you so much again for, for this uh, informative presentation. I really appreciate that. I'm sure most of the people here do. Um, are you coming back in two weeks, right? Yeah, I'm traveling, so I'll be away. Next Monday, I won't be available. Um, I'll be hanging out with the... Yeah, I won't be here. I'm not going to give anyone my GPS coordinates. And... Um, <laughs> right? And um, because Islam is the religion of peace, what do I have to worry about, right? <laughs> it's the religion of peace. I don't have to worry about that stuff. Now, do I? Do I? So, yeah, excuse the sarcasm. I don't hate Muslims, okay? I do not. I hate this ideology. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Thank you for coming. And uh, okay. we will be seeing you again in two weeks. And I will open the floor for free conversation. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Take care. Good night. I hope this was educational. Take care. Bye. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome.